All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the fifth annual Be Prep Patient Forum. Um, we're happy to have you with us this morning, and we have a great uh, um, morning lined up for you. So just a few uh, reminders for everyone. All of our panelists um, are going to be um, hidden until it's their time to to speak with you. They're on mute. Um, as our attendees, you are all automatically um, muted as well. But please, if you have questions, please put them into the chat. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the session. Um, and these sessions will be recorded um, and posted on our website after the uh, event. So we will go ahead and get started. Oops, maybe. All right, so before we jump into BPREP, our high-risk program, I want to tell you a little bit about where BPREP lives. And BPREP lives in the Comprehensive uh, Breast Center at Bregman Women's Hospital. Uh, see patients uh, for evaluation of non-specific uh, breast complaints, non-cancerous complaints. We do workups for abnormal breast imaging. And then, of course, we do evaluation of patients with suspected or known increased risk of breast cancer um, and or just patients who want to come in and learn more about their breast cancer risk. Um, we're going to talk a lot this morning about what those risk factors are. Um, and uh, but the, just again, the program is housed in the breast center at the Brigham and really anybody can come to our program either for an evaluation. So this is how it works. Again, anyone can uh, come in. Um, and any reason there at the top of the funnel, you see abnormal imaging, breast complaints, family history, dense breasts. Everybody who comes to the program takes a standardized risk assessment. And through that risk assessment is how we evaluate uh, whether patients are at increased risk and are eligible to stay in our uh, high risk program. Uh, or if patients are not at elevated risk, then that's also uh, reassuring. And those patients can go back and continue their um, follow up and their screening with their primary care physicians or their OBGYNs. And really, part of our goal is again to identify women at elevated risk, to educate them about what they uh, can do, and to learn from each of our patients. So the criteria for ongoing follow-up in our program, patients with the family history of genetic predisposition or suspected to have a pre genetic predisposition, uh, we work uh, collaboratively with our genetics colleagues from the Dana-Farber, uh, women who are found to have genetic mutations, we then uh, transfer their follow-up care over into the genetics program. Women who have variants of uncertain significance stay with us in the BPREP program. Uh, Women who have a personal history of radiation to the chest before the age of 30 are also at elevated risk for breast cancer. Uh, those, those women stay with us. Personal history of breast biopsy showing a high-risk lesion, which we'll talk a little bit more about this morning. And then women who have an elevated lifetime risk based on breast cancer risk prediction models uh, or those that have extremely dense breast tissue. So this is the group that is uh, we know at elevated breast cancer risk. And this is our program is there to serve these women again, to offer them opportunities for, to reduce their risk um, as well as to provide um, good ongoing clinical care. So this is our BPREP team. It's a multidisciplinary team composed of surgeons, of medical oncologists, again, uh, medical oncologists with an interest in risk and genetics. Um, we have uh, Mary Beth Hans, who I've highlighted here, who is co-director of the program with me, a senior PA, a senior NP, um, and a nurse. And I want to really highlight this bottom row of folks here. This is really our clinical staff. We couldn't do any of the good work we do without their support, um, helping us take, helping us get the patients uh, in and taking uh, excellent care of, of our patients. So our program really is about prevention. Um, we really do hope to make an impact on each individual that comes in, but also to um, an impact on the overall uh, trajectory of, of breast cancer in our in our communities. And so we started the program uh, in 2017. This is just a snapshot from our forum in 2019. This is one of our first uh, patients in our program, one of our first patients to participate in one of our clinical trials. And she actually spoke at the forum in, in 2019, and, and her video is available on our website, um, a really powerful a testimony to how our program um, impacted her and, and helped her. Excuse me. So a little plug here. Um, we are, again, trying to do our best to uh, help women understand their risk, uh, but we still know that we do have a disparities in our uh, environment. So we know that Black women are disproportionately affected with more aggressive cancers, and Black women are uh, more likely to die from their breast cancer. 
Uh, we have, again, a, a multidisciplinary team that includes a research team, and our team is studying the impact of societal stress on the immune system as a potential contributor to the disparities in outcome uh, for Black women with breast cancer. Uh, our team submitted a project uh, to a mechanism called Bright Futures, um, and they were selected from over 20 projects uh, to be as one of three finalists uh, for this prize. Now it's essentially a um, popularity contest. So now who wins the prize uh, is based on how many votes uh, the teams get. And so here's my selfish plug to ask each of you to go on to www.brightfuturesprize.org. Uh, and for our team, the team is uh, listed is shown there. Um, and the team, we really, again, really want to learn more about how um, stress and the immune system uh, leads to increased breast cancers aggressive breast cancers in black women and increased rate, rates of death. So I'll show this to you again at the end, but we appreciate your vote uh, so we can take this really important work forward. So let's just start then with a little bit. So what is cancer? So cancer is essentially a group of diseases characterized by uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal cells. And when respect to the breast, this little cartoon highlights here. So the normal milk duct is just lined by a single row of cells, all very uniform, same size, same shape. One of those cells goes bad for whatever reason and starts dividing. And in, in the middle panel, we see those abnormal cells now uh, filling the milk duct. And when those cells stay inside the duct, as shown there, that, that's the pre-invasive stage, or you'll hear the words uh, carcinoma in situ, duct carcinoma in situ. So that's the earliest form of breast cancer. And when those cells break through the wall of the milk duct and get out into the fatty tissue of the breast, that's when we have invasive breast cancer. And so what does it mean to be at increased risk? Well, it simply means that your chance of developing breast cancer is higher than the average woman. And so in the cartoon here, we have uh, 100 women and the average risk is one in eight or 12%. So the average risk woman has a 12% risk of developing breast cancer over her lifetime. We certainly know that there are a lot of risk factors for breast cancer, and we're gonna uh, touch on a lot of them today. Uh, again, a very common one that you hear about in the press is inherited mutations, so germline uh, predisposition to breast cancer. And we will have a genetics overview from uh, Jill Stop for today, one of our um, frequent speakers here um, in our in our BPREP program. So she'll be talking about genetics a little bit later this morning. We know that there are other uh, risk factors, and uh, these are what we call sort of reproductive risk factors. Your doctors ask you when you uh, started your menses, if you've been through menopause, how many children you have, et cetera. And those factors are used in what we call our risk prediction prediction models. We do use these models in our clinic, and they do give us a, a nice um, starting point to talk about risk, uh, but the models are not perfect. Uh, there is some variability, and we know the models don't account for race or ethnicity, again, which um, I said is very important in what type of breast cancer women get, and the models all don't account for lifestyle factors, which we're learning more and more about how those impact risk. So these are the three um, sort of top top lifestyle factors associated with breast cancer risk. So there's lots of evidence now about alcohol, obesity, and exercise. Um, for women, drinking more than one drink per day is associated with an increased risk for breast cancer. Uh, gaining weight when we go through menopause. So um, postmenopausal breast cancer risk is, is certainly linked to obesity. And then exercise. We know that women who regularly exercise have a reduced risk of breast cancer. And of course, the more you exercise, the more um, your risk is reduced. Obesity is a significant problem in our, in our community, in our world. In the United States, it's estimated that over 40% of uh, our population is obese. We know that over one in three adults struggle with obesity, and only about one in four adults meet the physical activity guidelines as, as set forth by um, the CDC and the American uh, Cancer Society to help reduce risk. So we're going to hear this morning from um, Dr. Eliason about the role of diet uh, in breast cancer prevention and uh, survival, and I'm, I'm I know this is going to be a really informative talk. Looking forward to that later this morning. And we're not going to talk uh, specifically about exercise uh, in this session, but I do want to highlight that we have had speakers on exercise in our previous forums, again, in our two 2020 forum. And so you can find a, 
a really nice lecture online about exercise. Um, but again, we do know that physical activity reduces breast cancer risk in both pre and postmenopausal women. The mechanisms of how uh, this exercise helps um, are various, and there's lots of um, continued work to understand how exercise reduces risk. But it is important to have regular exercise, um, you know, at least two to three days per week of moderate to vigorous exercise with about, you know, 150 minutes per week or of moderate of that moderate uh, intensity exercise. And this can be both aerobic and resistance training. And so again, for more information, I point you to our, um, our website, our form from 2020. We will have an exercise demo that will let you get up and stretch your legs a little bit during the morning. Uh, Nancy Campbell, again, um, a frequent speaker, a frequent uh, contributor here to our program, and she will show us um, some uh, nice activities that we can do just to break up our day. So again, exercise consistently shown to reduce breast cancer risk and um, standard recommendations for breast health should include consuming alcohol in moderation, maintaining a healthy BMI and including moderate intensity exercise. So our program, we take uh, very seriously the P, the personalized aspect of our program. Our goal is to really match each individual's unique risk profile with realistic, practical and acceptable lifestyle changes or interventions to help women uh, reduce their risk. And of course, we like to have provide the opportunity to participate in clinical studies as well, uh, but we know that there's a lot that we can do outside of those clinical studies. So just a little bit more about some of the other risk factors then. We hear a lot about breast density. Breast density is how your breasts look on a mammogram. It's not how they feel, but it's how they look on a mammogram. And here I'm showing you four different images where you can see on the uh, to your far left, that's a woman with fatty, fatty breasts, so that's not dense. And then all the way across to the right, you see we have increasing levels of density. And it's the far group on the right, the extremely dense breasts. This is the group that is associated with uh, increased breast cancer risk compared to women with fatty breasts. But it's important to note that most patients fall into the middle, fall into the two or three category here uh, in the middle, and there is no uh, significantly elevated breast cancer risk if you fall into the categories two or three, it's just if you fall into that category four, which is about 10% of women. So what is that increased risk? Well, we, we talk a lot about relative risk, three to five times, but the relative risk is not really what you wanna know. What you wanna know is your absolute risk. And so for women with those extremely dense breasts, here again, here we have those 100 uh, women. And so about 15 to 20 of those 100 women uh, will develop breast cancer due to their uh, dense breastity, or excuse me, their risk is increased due to uh, breast density. And again, that's about a 15 to 20% absolute risk. We'll have a nice overview of breast imaging this morning by one of uh, my colleagues at the Brigham, uh, Dr. Cho. Uh, she'll talk to us about the different modalities and again, what those risk factors mean. High risk breast lesions. Uh, as a surgeon, this is a uh, this is a group of, of uh, lesions that I am interested in, and we see women again who come in with these lesions. Um, there are about a million benign biopsies formed. Uh, benign biopsies, excuse me, performed in the United States in a year. About ten percent of those biopsies will demonstrate a typical hyperplasia. About four percent will demonstrate what we call lobular carcinoma in situ, and these are what we call the high risk breast lesions. And so again, about 140,000 uh, patients will be diagnosed with these lesions each year. We call them high risk for two reasons. Some of them, when diagnosed on a core biopsy, have a significant chance of actually being associated with cancer. And so we recommend surgical excision as a first step to make sure that there's not a cancer present. And this is most common with the lesion that we call atypical duct hyperplasia. We know when we take these patients to the operating room that up to 30% of them will actually have a breast cancer at that time. And so they're they are high risk because it's a core biopsy that may be upgraded to a diagnosis of cancer. Again, we're not gonna specifically talk about these lesions this morning, but I will refer you back again to our form from last year, 2021. The video is online where we had a really nice talk from our pathologist, Beth Harrison, talking, talking about these lesions and really, uh, really describing them quite nicely. But once we're sure that a patient does not have breast cancer at the moment, we know that there's some of these lesions that do put women at increased risk for breast cancer in the future. 
And so again, the three most common lesions that confer risk, high risk in the future are the atypical hyperplasias, atypical ductal and lobular hyperplasia, and lobular carcinoma in situ. And we know from very nice uh, long-term follow-up studies that women with the atypical hyperplasias develop breast cancer at a rate of about 1% per year. And women with lobular carcinoma in situ, it's about double that, about 2% per year. And so again, this is a group that we are particularly interested in uh, understanding what confers this risk and how can we impact risk in these groups. So again, translating that into it for an individual, what is the risk? So women with ADH or ALH, again, about a 15 to 20% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. For women with lobular carcinoma in situ, again, that's up to about a 20 to 25% risk, of course, depending on the age of diagnosis. The models, it's important to know that the models don't really perform well in women with these high-risk lesions, so we don't really, um, so we don't really uh, promote the models. We know that the Gale model underestimates risk for women with atypia, and the Tyre-Cusick model really significantly overestimates risk for women with uh, these lesions. And so I just put that out there in case you uh, are looking at these models or you receive a score from one of these models. If you have a high-risk lesion, they're not really very accurate. We do know that other factors can um, contribute to that risk. So women with LCIS and dense breasts have a higher risk of developing bre breast cancer than women with LCIS and fatty breasts. And that's demonstrated here in this nice work done by my colleague, Christina Minami, uh, who is one of our breast surgeons. But more importantly highlighted here is the impact of chemo prevention. So we know that the medications really significantly reduce breast cancer risk. You can see it reduces breast cancer risk by about 50%. That's what the hazard of 0.49 means. So these medicines are particularly effective. And here's just another uh, way of illustrating that. This is a large group of women uh, being in follow-up from Sloan Kettering when I used to be there. And you can see that the women who took chemo prevention in the red line are developing cancer at much lower rates than the women who did not take chemo prevention in the blue line. And we're going to hear again about these medicines, medicines this morning uh, from Dr. Bishkovsky, one of our medical oncologists that uh, works in the B prep program with us. So there is a large population at, at risk for breast cancer. About 10 million women in the United States between the ages of 35 and 79 are eligible for chemo prevention based on elevated risk. And this really represents about 15% of the population. And it's really, the onus is on us again to provide this education and also to provide options that are uh, toler tolerable for women to reduce risk. So I'm really excited this morning to get the show started to let you stop talk let you stop uh, hearing from me and go into our into our wonderful lineup of speakers. And this morning we're really excited to have um, Dr. Julia Brody with us. She is going to talk to us about breast cancer and the environment. This is not a topic that we've covered before at our forum, so um, we're really happy to be uh, bringing you new information. Um, and uh, again, if all of these videos will be available on our website um, shortly after the forum, uh, but I, I'm gonna stop here and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Julia Brody. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here this morning and I, I do have some slides to share, so I'm gonna take a moment to do that. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here and add this topic to your conversation. And I'm betting that a lot of you got up this morning to join this uh, conversation because you know something that most Americans don't know, consistent with what Dr. King has been telling you. Um, you may be surprised that two thirds of Americans think that cancer is mostly due to inherited genes. But um, we're here because that's not true. Breast cancer is influenced by many different factors across the life cycle, some of which you just heard about. And as you can, and you have already heard some of them, we can change. So, um, in the US today, um, about five or 10% of breast cancers are due to the high risk BRCA genes. Um, but, and a study of twins in Northern Europe showed that altogether about one third or a little bit less than a third of breast cancer risk is due to inherited genes, including ones we don't know very much about yet. 
So that means the more we learn about what's going on in that big blue chunk of the circle that isn't inherited genes, the more we can reduce breast cancer risk. And uh, Silent Spring Institute was founded about 25 years ago, specifically to look into that. We were founded by leaders um, of the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition to um, specifically to be a scientific team that would focus on environmental chemicals and breast cancer. Um, in addition to knowing that many breast cancers are, are not associated with high-risk inherited genes, we also know that um, genes and environment are interacting and that even with women who have the high-risk genes, environmental factors are affecting how old they are when they first get diagnosed. So I'm really excited to be here today to tell you some key examples of what we know now about the science, some strategies you can use to reduce harmful exposures, and some tips on how to spot misleading information and talk with skeptics. So starting with what we know now, we know that breast cancer is influenced at many stages across the life cycle. The breast is more developed uh, more vulnerable to carcinogens during the times when it's developing. These are called windows of susceptibility. It includes before birth, during puberty, during a first pregnancy, and at menopause. And some of those risk factors that Dr. King just told you about fit into this picture, like how old you were when you got your first period, how old you were when at a first pregnancy or and at menopause. Another thing that we know is that there are many different biological pathways to breast cancer. Uh, Silent Spring Institute is particularly focused on three of these chemicals that can alter breast development. So these are affecting those windows of susceptibility, changing how the breast grows in way that make, ways that make it more susceptible to carcinogens. Chemicals that affect hormones, they could mimic hormones or they could stimulate more production of hormones. We're particularly interested in chemicals that affect estrogen or progesterone, which we know are breast cancer risk factors. And the third group of chemicals are classic carcinogens. These are chemicals that damage DNA and can start a tumor. So there are well-established examples of each of these pathways. DES, the pharmaceutical, um, is an example of uh, of an exposure that influences breast development. We know that because unfortunately, women who took this drug during pregnancy, um, they took this drug in hopes that it would prevent miscarriage. It didn't do that, unfortunately. And we learned later that it increased breast cancer risk in both the moms and the daughters. An example of an exposure that, it, that increases hormone activity is combination estrogen and progesterone hormone replacement therapy, which you also saw, already saw in Dr. King's slides as a breast cancer risk factor. An example of a carcinogen that damages DNA is ionizing radiation, uh, especially when the exposure is early in life. And that is one of the ways that B-PREP is serving uh, women who for reasons that may have been necessary at the time we're exposed to ionizing radiation as girls. So um, we have laboratory tests for all of these biological pathways, but you may be surprised to know that in the US you don't have to test chemicals for safety before you put them into products. And because of that, these exposures are very common in all kinds of consumer products, things that you might've bought at the store, um, from cleaners and fragrances to, to plastics. And uh, some of these names are now familiar because of um, market campaigns, bisphenols like BPA, phthalates, which are anti-androgens, oxybenzone and benzophenone 3, which are UV filters, parabens, which are used as preservatives in some personal care products, and PFAS, this one has been in the news a lot lately. These are nonstick and stain resistant coatings and they've become common drinking water pollutants in many communities around the US 
We're very fortunate in the MWRA water supply that we don't have these chemicals, but they can also be in consumer products that we use all the time, certain kinds of dental floss um, and uh, non-stick and stain resistant textiles. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to avoid exposures as we go so we don't get too depressed about how common these chemicals are. Um, when you see these chemicals, the endocrine disrupting chemicals, some of them will be listed on product labels. So you can see, you can um, avoid parabens and the oxybenzone, benzophenone 3, these UV filters by looking at labels and buying products that don't contain them. For the sunscreens, you do of course wanna protect your skin uh, with hats and sun protective clothing and uh, mineral sunscreens. So chemicals that are breast carcinogens, these are chemicals that cause mammary gland tumors in animal studies, um, include benzene, which is in gasoline, chemicals in auto exhaust and air pollution, paint removers and solvents, some flame retardants, some pesticides, and some water disinfection byproducts. So one kind of hopeful thing to see here is that all the work we're doing to suppress climate change is also going to reduce exposures to breast carcinogens from gasoline and air pollution. Uh, so while we're, we're suppressing climate change, we're also creating a healthier future and reducing exposures to breast carcinogens. I'm just gonna tell you about two epidemiological studies that I think are really important. Um, I don't wanna wonk out on you too much this morning. But this study is really uh, an incredible resource for us to understand uh, environmental chemicals in breast cancer. You know, um, given that chemicals affect the breast across the life cycle, it's really hard to study them in humans because we don't know what we were exposed to 50 years ago in drinking water or air pollution or in our consumer products. But this study gives us an amazing insight into that trajectory. So um, DDT is a pesticide that was used very widely after World War II until it was banned in 1972 because of its effects on wildlife. And a visionary scientist in Oakland, California began recruiting women in the 50s and 60s who were giving birth at the Kaiser Hospital and collected blood samples from them a couple days after they had given birth. And these women and their children, and now their grandchildren, have been enrolled in the Child Health and Development Study ever since and followed. So we have uh, this amazing resource to understand their chemical exposures from their blood samples that were collected at the time of these births. And now that the moms, as the moms reach their 40s and 50s, and now their daughters are reaching these ages where they can be diagnosed with breast cancer, and we see just like with DES, higher breast cancer risk in both the moms and the daughters who had the highest exposure levels during these early years when DDT was in use. In fact, among the moms who were the right age to have been exposed to the highest levels of DDT, before they were 14 years old, so like just around puberty, um, they have five times higher breast cancer risk by the age of 50. This is an important cautionary tale for us to be careful about all these chemicals we're putting into use without testing them first and to uh, pay attention to those signals about chemicals that may affect breast cancer risk. The second uh, epidemiological study I want to tell you about is from the Long Island Breast Cancer Study, um, where they measured PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are products of combustion. So they're in air pollution, tobacco smoke, grilled and smoked food, and uh, other kinds of um, other kinds of sources of when something got burned or cooked at a high temperature. And they found that women who had the highest PAH markers in their blood and had genes for poor DNA repair had higher breast cancer risk. So these are women who were exposed to a carcinogen or uh, PH is actually of both carcinogenic and endocrine disrupting um, properties. 
And when women were exposed to these and their bodies were unable to repair that damage, then they had a higher breast cancer risk. So um, this is the message about this interaction between genes and environment. We see in precision medicine now a great deal of emphasis on genes, but to really be effective, we're going to have to balance that equation with a better understanding of the environment side of the equation. So turning now to how to avoid some of these chemicals that are, um, that are suspect because they're associated with biological activity linked to breast cancer. Um, I hope you'll try out Silent Springs uh, smartphone app, Detox Me. It uh, was created to share our knowledge with the wider public, and it includes 270 evidence-based tips to reduce harmful chemicals. You can download it on the App Store or Google Play, and you can check off um, safer practices you're already doing and commit to adding one or two a week or one or two a month, whatever works for you, track your progress and get badges. It, it's a lot of fun. It was uh, featured in the HBO movie, Not So Pretty this summer. So we got 100,000 new users and, and I hope you'll be in the next batch. Uh, if you prefer um, to use the top 10 tips list rather than going through them one at a time, you can um, get top 10 tips in um, different categories. I think all of us at Silent Spring have different favorite top 10 tips. I would say some of my top tips are go fragrance free. That's a very easy way to reduce your exposures to estrogenic chemicals. Um, uh, keep dust levels low. Use a damp cloth to wipe up dust or vacuum with a HEPA filter, a high efficiency filter. Now in the COVID era, everyone knows what that is. Um, wash Wash things with plain soap and water and uh, avoid some of these complicated products. Uh, another resource I love is Clearia. Clearia is a Chrome extension uh, and also a smartphone app. And it's great for online shopping. The Chrome extension is great for online shopping. It uses the Silent Spring Institute breast cancer list of breast cancer relevant chemicals and matches it to the ingredient lists on products and alerts you to products that you may wish to avoid. Uh, it's limited, of course, because in the US you don't have to list all the ingredients and products, but it takes you as far as you can go um, with products that are listed on the label. And that does help. Silent Spring Institute has, uh, two really important areas of research. One is to identify those chemicals that are affecting biological pathways to breast cancer. But the other is to study exposures and how to reduce those exposures. And we um, conducted a crowdsourced biomonitoring study called Detox Me Action Kit. It's possible some of you were in that study a few years ago. We asked women about their product use and collected urine samples. And what you see here um, is the results for parabens. Uh, everybody in the study had parabens in them. So uh, these are very common chemicals and there are many sources, some of which are hard to identify. What you see in the gray dots are women who didn't use any makeup and they have the lowest paraben labels, paraben levels. Um, but what you see in the purple is women who used makeup but read the label and avoided parabens their paraben levels are very similar to the people who didn't use makeup at all, while those orange dots are women who used makeup and didn't look at the label to avoid parabens. They have the highest levels, including some that are quite high. Another favorite study of mine, we uh, recruited five families of four in the San Francisco Bay Area and um, offered them a fresh food diet for seven days. And we found that that they were able to reduce their levels of BPA, an estrogenic chemical, and DEHP, a phthalate, which is anti-androgenic, uh, by more than half in just three days. So this is an indication that um, those chemicals in, in food packaging and processing are getting into the food we eat. This study, among others, inspired some state-level 
restrictions on uh, chemicals and food packaging. So things have improved, but we still have a long way to go. I'm especially proud of our work on flame retardants. We first measured flame retardants on Cape Cod in the early 2000s and found levels there 10 times higher than in Europe where these chemicals have been phased out for health reasons. Then we measured them in California where we found extremely high levels because of a particular state flammability standard. After this study was published, the governor revised the flammability standard. And because uh, California is such a big market in driving the country, um, uh, once that flammability standard was changed, you could suddenly buy couches without flame retardants here in Boston, as well as across the country. And um, good news about that is that those flame retardants were not actually providing safety for the le for against lethal fires. So it was a, a win all around and firefighters were among the strongest supporters of this change in the flammability rules. We've found since then that now that couches have been switched out, um, for example, in colleges, there are lower levels of these uh, toxic chemicals in college dorms. So this is an example that shows that when you think about actions you can take to reduce exposures, you need to be thinking not just about your own purchases, but about what's going on in the broader world since we can't control uh, the, the furniture at, at work or at the hospital or in college dorms by ourselves. Um, so think about actions all across the spectrum from things that you buy yourself to your role, perhaps in your workplace as a leader, um, influences on manufacturers and what they put into products and regulatory standards that keep us all safe. So um, in your tip, your action tips, uh, include voting in every election because these chemicals are controlled from the local to the national level. And I hope you'll tell your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors something that you learned about breast cancer and, and environmental chemicals. Uh, spread the word. And would love it if you um, keep in touch with Silent Spring. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website or follow us on social media. I just ask you to, to, to um, talk to other people about um, what you've learned. So I wanna provide a couple of um, tips about how to talk to people who give you some pushback. Um, so for example, especially in October, you're apt to hear messages like, there's no proof that XYZ causes breast cancer or there's no evidence. Um, these messages can be well-intentioned because no one wants to worry, um, but they also can be paralyzing and keep us from taking the actions we need to protect ourselves. Um, several major expert panels have made statements about this. For example, the president's cancer panel um, a few years ago said, we need an environmental health paradigm for long latency diseases to enable regulatory action based on compelling animal and in vitro evidence before cause and effect in humans has been proven. So what they're saying is we wanna act on the evidence that we have now and not wait for proof. Um, so much of the evidence comes from animal studies and um, in or cell studies in cells so we're trying to think about messages that will help people understand why we use this information. Um, and so see what you think about this. And uh, then, I'll, then I'll pause for questions. We um, learn about, learning about chemical safety from studies in animals and cells is important because we wouldn't do experiments on people to see if chemicals are harmful. In the US, we already use experiments in animals and cells to test whether medicines are safe before we give them to people. This kind of safety testing isn't required before chemicals are used in everyday products, but many scientists think they should be. And um, I know we got off to a slightly late start and I wanna be sure that we have time for questions. So, so I'll, I'll pause there.
Thank you so much, Dr. Brody. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So if you had a couple more slides, you feel free to go ahead. Okay, I would love to. So, um, you know, the National Cancer Institute, you would think would be a reliable source, but they're behind, they're behind on environmental chemicals and cancer. So um, if you go there, this is related to what kind of evidence we're going to use about breast cancer. Um, they, you'll see on their website, even if a chemical is shown in a laboratory test to cause cancer, this does not necessarily mean it will cause cancer in people. That's true. But the next sentence should be, often chemicals that cause cancer in lab tests do also cause cancer in people. And because of that, US EPA and the Food and Drug Administration use this information to make decisions to keep us safe. Another thing you might hear is that individual chemicals are likely to cause only a small increase in risk. This could be true sometimes and false sometimes, but in any case, we're exposed to many chemicals every day and the risks can add up. Besides small risks can add up to many people in the US getting sick. Uh, for those who wanna dig in further on the science, we sponsored, we co-sponsored, co-organized with Dana-Farber last year, uh, a forum series, and the recordings are all on our website and they're a great resource for if you want to refer skeptics or if you want to uh, dig in on the science yourself. Uh, here's a hopeful, hopeful um, study that showed that breast cancer incidence can go down when we change what we're doing. Um, in 2002, when the Women's Health Initiative was published, Many women went off that combination, estrogen, progesterone, hormone replacement therapy, and breast cancer incidence actually went down. Uh, researchers estimated that that resulted in 22,000 fewer breast cancer cases per year uh, when older women went off the combination HRT. So that makes me think about what we might see if we took seriously reducing the many exposures to breast cancer relevant chemicals, including chemicals that act like hormones. I hope you did learn a few things that you will find useful to create a healthier future for yourself, your family, and your community. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Brody. So we do have um, a couple of questions in the chat. And so since this is such a, an, an, since this is a new topic for us, um, people have certainly uh, learned from your discussion and um, they're looking forward to downloading the apps that you mentioned. And yes, just to remind everyone, these talks will be um, available on our website. So one question that we have is what about the chemicals in mosquito sprays? Uh, well, there are many different kinds of mosquito sprays. There are some that I use. Uh, um, DEET is not too bad, and there are some eucalyptus-based, um, uh, plant-based um, sprays. Picaridin is, is another one. Uh, those three I would consider um, safe. Uh, we have been learning more about the non-active ingredients in the wide area pesticide sprays. They can include PFAS. Um, it would be much preferable to reformulate these pesticides and not include those chemicals. Uh, we don't want to spray PFAS all over our communities um, because of concerns about mosquito. Wonderful. Thank you. And maybe I'll just ask one more because I know this is a, a, a hot topic for, for many people. What about hair color, dyeing our hair? Hair color is a suspect, suspect. Um, the the NI, National Institute of Environmental Health, Health Sciences sister study, which is one of the biggest breast cancer studies to take on environmental questions, has been studying hair dye and um, reported several results related to hair dye and particularly increased risk among black women who have used hair dye um, the, the darker hair dyes are more likely to contain uh, carcinogens. Um, this is a, a area of active research. It's hard to study for obvious reasons because people are changing the products they use, the products are changing formulation. 
But based on the results of the uh, NIH sister study, um, I would be cautious about hair dye. Thank you, An important note for all of us. And again, highlighting um, some disparities, as you said, if women, yes. if, if black women are at higher risk. So. Yes, that, I also wanna mention that Silent Spring Institute right now is partnering with black and Latina women in LA to specifically look at what kinds of hair products they're using. And uh, we've found that, we know that black women have higher levels of some of these endocrine disruptors in, in their urine. And um, we've tested hair products and found them there. So we're, we're trying to work on that specifically. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on this morning, uh, but again, uh, the slides, the lectures will be available on our website. And we are also keeping track of the questions that come in. So if we didn't answer your question this morning, um, we will be again, keeping track of these questions and we'll be including them in some of our future newsletters. So uh, we will get back to you. So we'll move on now. And now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Eliason, who is going to talk to us this morning about our diet. Whoops, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. King, uh, for the introduction. And uh, it's great to follow Dr. Brody, who has set the stage for the idea that things can be modifiable as we look at risk factors and potentially preventive factors for breast cancer. So today I'll address both um, breast cancer risk and what we know about the role of diet in prevention of breast cancer, as well as a bit on survival after a breast cancer diagnosis and how diet may play a role in improving a woman's chances of survival. So the burden of breast cancer, as I'm sure you all know, in the US and around the world continues and one of the things I like about this figure is that it shows the, not only the global burden of breast cancer, but it also highlights the fact that the burden is highest in westernized countries. So in the US, an estimated 280,000 women will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer this year. And this shows the incidence of invasive breast cancer on the right and ductal carcinoma in situ on the left. An incidence increased for both, particularly for DCIS with the uptake of screening mammography, uh, increasing 29% in 1987 and then uh, to 70% in 2000. Now, as you may know, breast cancer is often classified into two different subtypes. So there are further classifications that further divide these, but the main classifications are those that are positive for hormone receptors like the estrogen receptor, and therefore responsive to anti-hormonal treatment. And those that do not express hormone receptors, and these tend to be more aggressive tumors that are harder to treat. Um, and Dr. Brody has already alluded to, uh, pointed out the decline that we see in invasive breast cancer in the early 2000s that's primarily attributed to the reduction in the use of hormone therapy. And this decline in incidence was primarily seen in white women over the age of 50 and for ER positive disease, really lending itself to an explanation of the um, stopping the hormone therapy. Um, but as Dr. Brody pointed out, the reduction in incidence with the cessation of hormone therapy highlights that modifying the prevalence of some risk factors does make a difference and contributes to prevention of disease. Now, looking at survival, survival rates for breast cancer are better than many other cancers, but there's still an estimated 45,000 women who die of breast cancer each year in the US. And survival has improved with targeted treatments over the last few decades, but we still need to examine modifiable factors for survival to improve this further. So we'll start by looking at what we know about breast cancer and Dr. King went through a few of these and uh, Dr. Brody also talked about the life course impact of risk factors. So a number of breast cancer risk factors are well-established and many of these reflect hormonal exposure across the life course and higher levels of endogenous hormones. Those are naturally occurring sex hormones, estrogens and androgens in both pre and postmenopausal women are associated with higher risk of breast cancer. So some of these risk factors are not modifiable like genetics. Um, others may be harder to modify uh, like reproductive factors that have changed over time um, with changes in our societal norms and hormone therapy as we've uh, already discussed. However, there are some additional risk factors that are in fact modifiable. So we'll start with a few of those. 
So um, I just mentioned modifiable factors and weight should be modifiable, though we all know how challenging it can be. And there's also a recognition that for some, weight may not be modifiable. However, it's worth understanding the role of weight and adiposity in breast cancer risk. Now, unfortunately, the relationship between weight and breast cancer risk is slightly complicated. So we'll start with the complicated part. So we've seen very consistently that women who were overweight as girls, so this is looking at adolescent body size, childhood body size between the ages of five and 10. So those who are overweight are at a lower risk of breast cancer throughout premenopausal and postmenopausal years. And on the flip side, the red line going up as uh, the figures get leaner shows that risk of breast cancer actually increases among lean girls um, uh, and they have an increased risk of breast cancer later in life. If we move through the life course, we also see that excess weight in early adulthood, so this is looking between uh, in reproductive years, this is here at 30, ages 35 to 44, is associated with lower risk. So moving from the normal weight category to overweight and from overweight to obese, there's about a 13% reduction in risk. Uh, and so overall, per five unit increase in BMI, which is a measure I think we're all familiar with, there is a, a decreased risk here. So this makes for a very complicated public health message because as you know, excess weight is problematic for many reasons increasing risks of many chronic diseases. However, as Dr. King had already mentioned, the story shifts after menopause. So after menopause, when natural sex hormone levels decline, excess body weight serves as a reservoir for the synthesis of estrogen. And women with higher BMI have higher circulating levels of estrogen, contributing to increased risk of breast cancer. So here, if we look at uh, compared to women who had relatively no change across adulthood, so from age 18 all the way um, until uh, after menopause. So looking at the bars on the right with increasing weight gain, risk of breast cancer increases as well. Such that um, a woman with a 25 kilogram gain in weight over that time is about at about twice the risk of breast cancer compared to women who maintain their weight. And given the length of circulating estrogens, we also see this most strongly with ER positive tumors. So 25 kilograms or about 55 pounds sounds like a lot, but this is done in our large nurses health study and the mean gain in this population was about 30 pounds. So about a quarter of our 100,000 women um, fell into this highest category of weight gain. And this is across all of adulthood. Um, but one thing that I think is important to look at is if we consider that weight is a modifiable factor, we see that women who enter menopause and then lose weight, so looking at the left side of this figure, uh, have a lower risk of breast cancer compared to women whose weight is stable. So we see a higher risk of women, uh, for women who gain weight and about a 50% reduction in risk for women who are able to lose the weight and keep it off about 10 kilograms after menopause. And this is done in the large nurses health study, but it's been um, confirmed in a very large pooling project with over 180,000 uh, women showing a, about a 30% reduction for women who lost nine kilograms. So again, this, if we can consider weight as being modifiable and looking at it after menopause, we, one of the other things I really like to focus on is the fact that it's never too late to change something like this and change risk. So um, Dr. King had also briefly mentioned physical activity, and I also wanna briefly mention that as well, mostly in terms of thinking about this from the perspective of it's never too late to change. So we know that risk factors impact across the life course, but we were able to look at physical activity in postmenopausal women and looking at increasing physical activity going to the right, we see a decreased risk of breast cancer here. So we see about a, a reduction in breast cancer risk about 10% for women who are physically active about an hour a day compared to inactive women. So then the other important finding here is that we see similar to uh, weight, it's never too late to change. So this is looking at comparing activity before and after menopause. So compared to women who had low activity both before and after menopause, Women who increase their activity after menopause or who had maintained higher levels low, have a lower risk of breast cancer. 
So women who enter menopause as inactive um, but become physically active also experience about a 10% reduction in the risk of developing breast cancer. So now we'll move on to aspects of diet and their role in breast cancer development. So Dr. King had mentioned the, the alcohol being a pretty well-established, uh, though modest risk factor for breast cancer. Um, it's very consistent across studies and even apparent at relatively low consumption levels. So these results come from a very large pooled project pulling in 20 different studies that include more than a million women and 26,000 cases of breast cancer. And you can see, uh, starting with no alcohol consumption and looking at intake over uh, the, the um, uh, distribution of intake. And if we consider uh, 10 to 15 grams being about a, a equivalent to a drink, um, the increased risk starts at very low levels of alcohol intake. Then when we look by ER status um, here, we don't see any significant differences between the ER positive tumors, which are in blue, and the ER negative tumors, which are in red. So the overall, there's about a 10% increase in risk per drink per day. And we didn't see any difference by family history of breast cancer. And in another study looking at um, genetic risk, there was no difference by uh, genetic risk. So it appears that alcohol is a modifiable risk factor for women who are at um, average risk and those who are at higher risk based on family history or their genetics. And the results are also similar, whether you're looking at beer or wine or liquor. So moving on to other aspects of diet, carotenoids have been a particular interest of mine and they're particularly interesting for breast cancer. So you've probably heard about these um, individual carotenoids, alpha carotene and beta carotene, which are found in carrots and sweet potatoes, um, lutein and zeaxanthin that are found in dark leafy greens and lycopene, which is found in tomatoes. And we can either calculate people's intake by asking them what they ate so using a variety of diet questionnaires, or we can actually measure these uh, nutrients directly in blood samples. And the advantage of using blood samples in a study like this, it is it allows us to get at a more true internal exposure, which is different for different individuals based on how the vegetables were cooked or not, and differences in, between individuals in absorption and metabolism. So here in this study, we pooled together uh, eight different studies of women with, uh, who went on to develop breast cancer after we collected their blood samples and measuring the carotenoids in blood samples. So this is going from the lowest level um, at the top of each of these to the highest level. So this is the, the top fifth of women in the top category of alpha carotene had a reduced risk of breast cancer. Similar findings for beta carotene, lutein zeaxanthin, and lycopene. And then when we sum all the carotenoids to total carotenoids. So this shows about a 15 to 20% reduction in breast cancer risk for women in the top fifth of carotenoid levels. Now, when we look by um, ER status, um, ER positive, so those tumors that express estrogen receptors versus the ER negative, one interesting finding, this is looking with beta carotene, is that we see a suggested reduction in risk for women in the top fifth of carotenoid beta carotene levels with ER positive tumors, but a quite a strong reduction in risk for those ER negative tumors, which are, uh, horm they don't have hormone receptors and they're often harder to treat and more aggressive. So this gives us something that is actually modifiable to reduce the risk of more aggressive breast cancer. So these women had about a 50% reduction in the risk of ER negative breast cancer in that top fifth of circulating levels of beta carotene. Um, and in further analyses, we had looked at other aspects of aggressive breast tumors and found similarly strong associations for those that are poorly differentiated or those that ultimately recur. So this seems like a promising factor to reduce risk and we're always interested in whether these modifiable factors will make a difference for women who are at higher underlying risk, whether it's by looking at mammographic density or family history or genetic risk. And we do see in other studies that these carotenoids are um, also are associated with lower risk of breast cancer in women who have underlying higher risk by breast density or by genetic risk. So that's sort of a nice feature of thinking about things that are modifiable even if there are other aspects of your history that suggest you're at higher risk. 
Now, let's get moving on to um, consumption of broader fruits and vegetables. We have in these nurses' health studies many decades of follow up. So, we have the ability to see some fairly modest associations between dietary factors and breast cancer risk. So, here we were able to look in depth at fruit and vegetable intake and looking at specific types. So, looking at total intake of fruits and vegetables, and this again is going by um, increasing servings per day going to the right and the bars going below one showing a reduction in risk of breast cancer. So overall, we see about a 10% reduction in risk um, of breast cancer for more than uh, five a day compared to women consuming fewer than three a day for fruits and vegetables. And we see this most strongly for yellow and orange fruits and vegetables. So this should uh, make you think of carotenoids as well as for cruciferous vegetables. So these each have about a 10% reduction in risk um, for daily consumption compared to two or few servings per week. So this suggests that there may be something important beyond carotenoids. And similar to the carotenoids, um, results by ER status showed stronger associations for fruits and vegetables for those ER negative tumors. Uh, now thinking about fruits, we did note that fruit juice intake was not associated with a lower risk of breast cancer. Then when we zoom out a bit and look at overall patterns of diet, one of the patterns we've looked at recently is plant-based diets. And as you can imagine, there could be both healthy and unhealthy possibilities in plant-based foods. So looking at the pictures here, you can see some rather healthy choices for plant-based foods. And then these are all technically plant-based, but they're rather unhealthy choices. So this pattern considers both healthy plant foods and unhealthy plant foods as well as the frequency of consumption of animal foods. So we're not looking at a strictly vegetarian diet here, but overall, whether the diet is more tending towards plant-based and more tending towards healthy. So overall, if we look at plant-based diet, regardless of whether it's healthy or unhealthy components, we see that women who, who consume more of the healthy plant-based diet have a lower risk of breast cancer. So it's about a 10% reduction in risk for women who are in this top fifth of the plant-based dietary index. When we focus on ER negative disease, we can see um, on the left, this is for the overall plant-based diet. And we see a lower risk of ER negative breast cancer with a higher consumption of a plant-based diet. And then when we specifically look at the healthy plant-based diet, we also see a reduction in risk of these ER negative breast tumors with the healthy plant-based diet. So it's about a 20% reduction in risk of ER negative breast cancer for women in that top fifth of the healthy diet. We've also attempted to further control for consumption of carotenoids and dietary fiber and fruits and vegetables, and they didn't substantially affect the estimate. So it's looking at a diet altogether, and this is sometimes easier to adopt too. So of the um, food groups, you know, you can consider whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts, legumes, vegetable oils, and coffee and tea uh, as being components of this healthy diet. Now, another dietary pattern we've assessed is one that is associated with a lower risk of developing diabetes. And this comes from a lot of our work looking at dietary intake and then subsequent risk of diabetes. And it includes nine factors that focus on higher consumption of cereal fiber, nuts, coffee, fruits, and more polyunsaturated and less saturated fats. And then also a lower consumption of foods with a high glycemic index, those that are likely to result in um, insulin um, spikes, lower consumption of trans fats, um, juices and sugar sweetened beverages, and also lower consumption of red and processed meat. And overall, we found uh, a a modest inverse association with about an 8% lower risk of breast cancer for women in the top fifth. And when we looked at the individual components, coffee was suggestively associated with lower risk overall as were whole fruits. And coffee was more strongly associated with ER negative tumors. So we I currently have more work ongoing here digging further into coffee with more follow-up and we're continuing to see the same inverse association for ER negative breast cancer. So now I wanted to um, switch gears and uh, give that, you know, that gives you a sense of the dietary factors that we've found to be important for breast cancer incidence. And now we'll move on to thinking about how diet may impact survival after breast cancer diagnosis. 
So recall that survival rates after breast cancer are very good, particularly compared to other cancers. So women who have breast cancer ultimately end up dying mostly of other causes and not breast cancer. So we've been careful to look at both breast cancer specific survival as well as overall survival uh, when we examine dietary factors. So in our um, cohorts, we collect dietary information every four years, and we're able to look at diet both before diagnosis as in the prior analyses of risk, as well as how diet after diagnosis is associated with survival. So you'll see some commonalities in the dietary factors that seem to make a difference here. So we'll start with fruit and vegetable intake. And on the left here is the association with breast cancer specific mortality. So that is, did a woman diagnosed with breast cancer ultimately die of breast cancer? And on the right is all cause mortality. So what, uh, you know, regardless of how, the cause of death, um, how it's associated with death after breast cancer diagnosis. So with fruit and vegetable intake, we don't see too much of an association here uh, with breast cancer specific mortality but we do see um, a decreased risk of all-cause mortality with higher consumption of fruits and vegetables here. So these and the inverse associations seem to be largely driven by uh, leafy green and cruciferous vegetables. And when we look at some of the um, fruit intake, we see inverse associations with breast cancer specific mortality for blueberries and strawberries. And these were also associated with lower all-cause mortality. Now fruit juice, however, is a different story. So here we saw significantly higher mortality among women consuming higher levels of fruit juice, particularly for breast cancer specific mortality. In examining the components, we found this to be driven mostly by things like apple juice and not so much by orange juice. And in another paper, we see increased mortality among women who consume more sugar sweetened beverages. So thinking about the impact of sugar after a diagnosis of breast cancer seems to be important. Then getting back to the benefits of coffee, we see lower mortality, both breast cancer specific here on the left, as well as um, overall mortality for women with a higher consumption of coffee after breast cancer diagnosis. So we also showed that women who went from low coffee consumption um, before diagnosis and increased their consumption after diagnosis had a lower more risk of mortality. So coffee has many components, including caffeine, but also many polyphenols and other potentially bioactive compounds that may be playing a role here. And thinking about antioxidants, as well as the impact of insulin. So the positive associations with fruit juice and sugar sweetened beverages, and the inverse associations with coffee all point to exposures that could be related to insulin resistance, suggesting that insulin response after breast cancer may be important. So moving further into the realm of thinking about insulin response, we come back to the diabetes risk reduction diet and recall that this pattern was associated with lower risk of development of breast cancer. And here we examine the impact of the same dietary score after diagnosis and subsequent survival. And we see a benefit for breast cancer specific survival, as well as a stronger benefit for overall survival. So women who are consuming more of these foods um, that are beneficial, the whole grains, the, or the cereal fiber, the um, whole fruits, um, nuts and legumes and coffee, um, have a better uh, survival after breast cancer. So finally, I'll touch briefly on alcohol intake. And here the story actually differs from the relation between alcohol and breast cancer development where there's, it's a consistent and well-established risk factor. For survival, alcohol does not appear to be associated with worse survival, either breast cancer specific or overall survival, and perhaps suggests a benefit for overall survival given some of the um, cardio benefits of alcohol. Um, others that we can uh, touch on uh, include vitamin D, the relationship with the risk of breast cancer is not totally clear, um, but some preliminary studies um, show potentially some promise for survival of breast cancer. Um, physical activity is also beneficial after uh, breast cancer diagnosis, um, just to touch on. So uh, in summary, we've identified several aspects of diet and potentially other modifiable lifestyle factors that are associated with breast cancer risk. And while the inverse association between early life weight and breast cancer risk makes for a very challenging public health message, we all know that excess weight carried after menopause adversely impacts the risk of developing breast cancer. 
and adverse uh, effects of adiposity earlier on many other chronic diseases. Alcohol, although modest in magnitude, clearly increases risk of developing breast cancer, but does not seem to adversely impact survival after diagnosis. Uh, healthful dietary patterns, including those that are consistent with lowering diabetes risk, and healthful plant-based diets are associated with both lower risk of breast cancer development and better survival after diagnosis. Colorful fruits and vegetables, including um, those where we can measure in circulating carotenoid levels, cruciferous veg vegetables, and coffee are all associated with both lower risk of breast cancer as well as better survival. And while each of these are associated modestly with outcomes, they're all part of healthier diets. So the fact that they may also lower breast cancer risk and improve survival may provide all of us with more impetus to adopt better diets and healthier diets. And uh, with that, I'll say thanks and go on to questions. Thank you so much. That was uh, so informative and you know a good reminder for all of us. We do have some uh, several questions. Um, there's People are intrigued by coffee. I'm a coffee drinker too. So, um, but we have some questions. You know, does it matter if it's decaf uh, coffee or tea? Do you have the same effect with decaf? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I myself am a coffee drinker. However, I'm a decaf drinker <laughs> um, because of uh, impacts that I have on on heart palpitations. So. Um, we don't know for sure what components it is, but I, for one, am hoping that it's more of the polyphenols that are uh, present in both calf and decaf, um, but I think it needs a little more study. Okay, and um, they, they heard your message about increasing intake of fruits and vegetables. Um, is there a difference between buying organic fruits and vegetables versus non-organic? Oh, that's a great question. And um, I know Dr. Brody would uh, recommend, you know, avoiding some of the, the persistent chemicals um, and uh, pesticides. Um, the benefits of fruits and vegetables, we actually have looked by um, categories of fruits and vegetables that tend to be higher in pesticide content. And the benefits, um, you know, we can still see benefits with breast cancer risk, regardless of whether it's organic or not. Um, but I think, you know, if, if somebody has uh, the resources to choose, uh, we can also consider impacts on the environment and in those choices. Okay. And how about sugar? So uh, sweet, sugary juices um, increase risk. Um, what about just putting sugar in your coffee or is there a healthy substitute for sugar in your coffee? Oh, that's a good question too. And I think thinking about sugar, we should think about our, you know, the diet across the day is how much sugar are you eating in terms of added sugar? So whether it's a spoonful in your coffee or the additional sugar in processed foods, it's good to think about what that quantity is over the day and see if you, there are ways that you can reduce it. Um, we, we do see, you know, an impact of the, the fruit juice and the um, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, particularly after breast cancer diagnosis. So any ways that that, uh, that can be reduced is is a good thing. And I, you know, there are often um, uh, pitches for natural sugar, thinking about whether it's agave syrup or, uh, you know, maple syrup or honey, um, but to your body, sugar is sugar. And so, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter the source of it and what the impact is. But of course it's okay to have that dessert every once in a while, right? Absolutely, <laughs> okay. especially if there's chocolate involved. <laughs> And how about vitamin D? Should women be having their vitamin D levels measured? Should they be taking vitamin D to reduce risk? So vitamin D has been uh, sort of a much uh, promised and you know highly anticipated component of, of cancer risk reduction. We, we don't see a lot of evidence for an association between vitamin D either measured in the blood or looking at um, supplement use and risk of breast cancer. Um, as I had suggested, there, there's some evidence that it may help improve survival after breast cancer diagnosis, um, but right now there's not a lot of evidence to show that it reduces risk of breast cancer. Okay. And even though it's not in the, in the chat, you know, being in the, in the clinic with patients every day, we do get a lot of questions about alcohol and, and I mentioned it and you mentioned it, but I, but I do want to point out what you said is that it, it is a moderately it is a moderate increased risk. So if you, if we, 
if you like to have a glass of wine each evening or maybe two some evenings, um, you shouldn't feel t terrible about that. The, the increased risk associated with alcohol use is relatively small. Again, if we go from the average woman that has a 12% risk, um, a woman who has very high alcohol consumption uh, increases that risk probably into the, the 15, maybe 15 to 20% range at first or really high consumption, but women who drink in moderation, again, that risk probably goes from, again, your average risk women of about 12%, you know, maybe up to 13 or 14%. It's not, we're not talking about, um, you know, significantly elevated risk, but of course, alcohol in moderation is important for our overall all health in general. So I just say that because maybe people aren't, maybe nobody wants to ask that question, but certainly in the office, we get that question all the time. So Absolutely, yeah. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Eliason. It was wonderful. Uh, so we're going to move on now to our um, exercise demo. So we've heard a lot about the importance of exercise. Um, and so we have Nancy Campbell with us uh, from the Zacom Center at Dana-Farber to uh, give us a little exercise demo. Uh, and after the exercise demo, we're going to give you all a little uh, break this morning. Uh, so we'll have the exercise demo for about 20 minutes. We'll break from until 1045, and then we'll return with our breast imaging update. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Nancy. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to get us marching in place here. So if you've been sitting all morning listening to these wonderful talks, go ahead and stand up with me. We'll start marching in place. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. King, the planning committee. It's my third year, so I greatly appreciate coming back every year and joining all of you. So we're gonna do a little bit of warm up, just because most of us, I'm gonna assume, have been sitting, although maybe some of you have been, you know, listening to this on a walk outside or on your treadmill or something like that. Uh, and then we're gonna move into some strength moves. So we've heard a lot about the impact of exercise so far today. I work in the Zacom Center at Dana Farber, so I work with a lot of uh, breast cancer survivors. We're going to go into a V-step. So we're going to step forward one and then back narrow. I'm going to alternate my feet, add some hand movement here. So a lot of the women that I talk to, you know, whether it's in the Zacom Center or outside in the community, for most of us, walking is at least easy in the sense that short of a good pair of sneakers, whether that's hopefully, uh, you know, cooperating or indoor exercise. For most of us, that piece is, you know, again, on the easy side. The strength piece is where it gets a little complicated. COVID's thrown some wrenches into that for people. If you used to go to the gym, maybe you don't feel comfortable going back, things like that. I'm hoping this morning to kind of show you how to incorporate some strength moves easily into your day. So that is my goal here. We're gonna do three more, two more, one more. Now we're gonna march a bit wider so that from the wide march, we can bend one knee and then the other. So my goal, you know, minimal equipment here, minimal space, help you get all your major muscle groups covered in a short period of time. You know, I think for all of us, that's a big key is you know, not enough hours in the day. So if we can find ways to sneak this activity in, you know, even potentially on a Zoom call if your camera's not on or <laughs> we can get creative here or, you know, some things we'll do today, like when you're brushing your teeth at night, you know, things like that, taking advantage of that. We're gonna do three more with each leg, two more, one more. Now we're gonna do a tap and a reach. So the main reason I tend to do a movement like this is for us to think about our shoulder blades and moving them. So you'll also notice I'll kind of go through and reach in different directions. And sometimes those shoulder blades will get a little, little sticky, little cobwebs in there that we want to kind of dust off. So moving through, so really trying to actively reach with those arms, three more to each side, two more, one more. Okay, we'll go back to our march. We'll bring our feet still. So hopefully 
that got the blood flowing a little bit. We're gonna transition now to more strength-based stuff. So I'm gonna demo a plie squat. If you know that plie squats don't work in your body, our regular squat is totally fine. So if you're joining me for the plie, you are wider than your hip distance, turning your toes as far to the side as they can comfortably go. You could grab weights, you could just use your body weight. I tend to hold my hands here. If you have a weight, you can hold it here. We're gonna lower down into a plie squat and then come all the way back up. So again, down and up. So we could do this, you know, while we're brushing our teeth. <laughs> Uh, you know, standing, uh, depending on how willing you are to do things like this in public, <laughs> waiting for the bus, uh, things like that. But again, you know, taking a couple of minutes, we get a lot of bang for our buck here. We get some inner thigh, not a muscle we use a lot. We get some quads in the front. We get some hamstrings and glutes in the back. Get a little balanced because our feet are turned down a little bit. So get a good amount of benefit from just this one exercise, which is great. We'll do three more, two more, one more, and up. Okay, so we just got, again, a lot of lower body stuff going. So let's move to upper body. I will demo this with a weight. If you happen to have weights nearby, soup cans, water bottles, wine bottle, <laughs> go ahead and grab that. That's always a possibility. So you could use, you could come um, to a wall, you could have a chair in front of you, or you could just put your hand on your opposite thigh. So again, minimal equipment here. So my arm's gonna come forward and then I'm gonna pull up to my hip bone, forward. So I'm sort of moving in a uh, diagonal motion. So I'm kind of coming, down and forward, up and back. So really good for posture, helping us kind of undo our more typical daily posture uh, of the shoulders rounding forward. So here, helping to keep those upper back muscles nice and strong. So one of the challenges that a lot of people will mention, particularly exercising at home, is maybe not having the array of weights that a gym had. We're gonna do two more with this side. One, one more. We're gonna switch. So opposite foot forward, and then weight in the opposite hand. Slight lunge forward. Again, we exhale up and back. So, you know, back to this sort of Goldilocks concept. You've got weights at home that are really light. You might have another random weight at home that's too heavy. <laughs> uh, and so how do we, you know, how do we work with this? So you have a couple of options, something like this. We're working some, you know, our biggest, strongest upper body muscles here. A lot of these back muscles. So you could potentially grab the heavier object as long as it's you know safe, do as many as you can. And it might be two or three. And then go ahead and lower to either a lighter weight, maybe just the weight of your arm. And then when it's on the lighter side, just go a little bit slower. So instead I'm going up for about two or three, you can go up for about three or four. I'm gonna do one more on this side, exhale. And down. Okay. So just with these two exercises, we've covered leg muscles, upper back muscles. Um, so we've already done a lot. Um, I'm gonna throw in some balance here. So I'm gonna grab a chair. Um, you are welcome to just use a wall, but just for demo purposes here, I'm gonna use my chair. So I feel like we all need to be thinking about balance and, and keeping it as part of our routine. So the leg that's closest to the chair or the wall, you're going to shift your weight into it so this other leg has some room to move. From here, this outside leg is going to move out to the side. 
and then back down, ideally not putting any weight into it. So it goes out as far as feels comfortable. But as you come down, you just don't want to shift your weight back. So balance, again, always important. Certainly with, you know, the season following this one, <laughs> I'm having a hard time even acknowledging that it's October today and fall, um, but knowing that winter is at least here in the Northeast <laughs> around the corner, potentially, you know, snow, ice, things like that. We're gonna do two more where balance is exceptionally important. I do one more. Switch sides. So, yep. Same thing. Leg closest to the chair. Shift your weight. Other foot. Try to keep those toes pointed forward as you go out. But what I often remind people, we, you know, when we see black ice or we know that there's black ice or it's snowing, you know, we tend to modify the speed that we're walking, be a little bit more cautious. I think where some of us get tripped up is uh, weather that's uh, potentially starting out your window today is rain paired with wet leaves, which doesn't always occur to us that like that can be almost more slippery and dangerous than black ice. Um, so knowing the more we improve that balance will help us year round, <laughs> but certainly in the coming two seasons, uh, here in the Northeast. We'll do two more on this leg out. You can always pause out here if you're not really feeling these. We'll do one more. Okay, so we mostly did that from a balance perspective, but I'm gonna assume that many of you, myself included, feel this in the hip uh, muscles, ones that we don't, again, like use a ton in a daily basis. So we're gonna round out our upper body by doing some chest work. And normally anytime I talk about doing push-ups, I get a lot of pushback <laughs> from people saying, I can't do those, those are too hard. We're gonna use our wall here. This is going to help us um, be able to modify this. Certainly if you, you know, have a couch nearby or a countertop, that's great. I'm gonna demo with the wall. So my hands wind up a about shoulder distance, maybe a smidge wider. And then the further you are from the wall, the more challenging it will be. And obviously there's a limit to how far back you can go. From here, I think of these as a moving plank. So I'm going to inhale, move my body towards the wall in front of me. And then I'm gonna exhale and push away. So inhale forward. And exhale back. So you'll notice that my elbows are dropping slightly as I come forward. So I'm trying to avoid having them come up and out here. And instead, they're almost pointing in like a downward arrow from like an elbow to my head to my other elbow. That should feel better on your shoulders if you've traditionally had pain with push-ups in your shoulders. You wanna keep that entire surface of your hand against the wall. So try to make sure that you're not doing any kind of clawing with the hands. We'll do two more, inhale forward. Exhale all the way back to straight elbows. One more. Okay, so now with four exercises, we really, almost gotten all the major muscle groups covered. Um, we're gonna do a little bit um, more balance, but we're gonna kind of isolate the calf muscles here. Um, very important in our ability to walk, run, jump, um, and some, again, bonus balance. So feet are hip distance apart in front of the chair or the wall, string from the top of your head. You're gonna come straight up onto your tippy toes and then slowly back down. So again, straight up. Sometimes when our hands are in front of us, we tend to move in that direction where instead we wanna think about coming straight up towards that ceiling. 
And this is balanced, just like our last one, where you get to determine how much do you need the chair? Safety first, of course. But if you're feeling stable, you know, can you get to one or two fingertips? Can you potentially hover a little bit? But always sort of having something nearby. This is also a good exercise when you're brushing your teeth doing the dishes, waiting at the bus stop. <laughs> so lots of ways to incorporate movements like this. And then I also encourage on this one, to try to be mindful of your foot and how you are distributing your weight. So as you come onto your tippy toes, make sure you're pushing through your big toe, and then all the other four toes. Depending on your footwear and any potential foot issues, that can be harder than one might think. One more, up and down. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and have a seat um, to show you something that you can be doing when you are on that Zoom call, but you still have to be on camera. What can you be doing? <laughs> but not have anybody know. Um, sort of the benefit is most of us are seen, you know, from here up on Zoom. So here we can sort of scoot, you know, midpoint of our chair, sit up tall. We're gonna bring one leg up just a little bit. We want a little clearance from the floor, but I'm still up tall. From here, I'm gonna extend this leg and then I'm gonna bend it. So as you see me from the side, I'm up nice and tall. What sometimes will happen here is we'll do sort of this. <laughs> we kind of get the body moving back and forth. We want to kind of lock that core tight, keep that nice stacked posture and have the work be in the quad, the front of the thigh, potentially some hip flexor, um, which for some of us, if we sit a lot, myself unfortunately included in that group, uh, the hip flexors can sometimes uh, let you know when you're doing an exercise like this that they are uh, getting a little bit tired. <laughs> so seeing where you do feel it, uh, my goal would be sort of in the middle of your thigh. We're going to do one more. Okay, and then we're going to switch to the other side. So again, just a little bit of a lift, give yourself some clearance and out and back. So here we have the ability to see, is one leg a little bit stronger than the other, have a little bit more range of motion than the other. You know, some of the exercises we've done today, like the push up, we have both arms. So we can't always determine um, which side might be a little bit stronger. And we have to default essentially to the weaker side here, particularly if you have some underlying knee issues, hip issues, one leg at a time being quite helpful. And knowing again, this sort of Goldilocks concept here where you could theoretically make these more challenging by having an ankle weight on, but you could also just add this pause out here. And you might even notice that you really start to shake um, when you're doing that. And that is normal. We're gonna do one more out and then back. Okay. So that was what you get. That was six exercises, like 15-ish minutes that it took us to do that. So you know, I want to encourage you to sort of think about, you know, you can totally do these six. There are so many apps um, you know, that are out there and trainers that are out there and online things for you know, not a tremendous amount of money. We have great resources in the Zakem Center at Dana-Farber. We have an entire YouTube channel of exercise classes that you can join. But I hope that this, if strength training has been something you've done in the past, want to get back to or never done, this gives you some ideas of things you can do in your house with minimal equipment. So thank you all uh, for your attention and hopefully get a little uh, bio break here. And uh, I appreciate your attention.
and movement. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Nancy. That was wonderful. I hope that everybody uh, got up and enjoyed that. Um, so now we are going to take a, a little break, about 10 minutes. And uh, when we come back, we will um, have an overview of breast imaging. So um, we'll see you back at 1045. Thank you. Hi, hi, I'm Jihee Cho, I'm a breast imaging radiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'll be discussing overview of breast imaging today. So the goal of breast imaging is to detect breast cancer early. I mean, early cancer detection allows more effective treatment and then can reduce breast cancer related deaths. And the main three imaging modalities that, that are available to develop breast cancer are mammogram, MRI, and ultrasound. And I'll go over, over each one a little bit more in detail and also briefly discuss about contrast and has mammogram at the end of the talk. So mammogram is an x-ray that is specifically designed to take image of a breast, and it plays a key role in breast cancer screening. Now, multiple observational studies of screening mammogram um, that showed that there are 30 to 40 percent fewer deaths due to breast cancer among women screened with a mammogram compared to women who do not undergo screening. So there is a really good benefit of getting screening mammogram every year. I'm just going to explain what it means to be called back from a screening mammogram. So out of every 100 women who get screening mammogram, about 90 will be told that their mammograms are normal, and 10 will be asked to come back for additional imaging, usually another mammogram and or ultrasound. And among those 10 people, one or two will need, end up needing a biopsy. And about 25% of biopsies will turn out to be cancer. Just wanted to point out these numbers as additional imaging and a biopsy can cause anxiety. And however, only a small number of people who get called back from screening mammogram end up like being diagnosed with breast cancer. And then it's because we're looking for all these signs of breast cancer and this can be very subtle on imaging. So what are potential signs of breast cancer on mammogram that radiologists are looking for? So the cancers can present as mass, calcifications, architectural distortion, or focal asymmetry and asymmetry. I'm mentioning these terminology as you may see these on your know, mammogram report. And we also use terminology questionable on our screening mammogram report as we really need additional imaging to clarify whether these signs are truly present. You may also see breast density on the report. So breasts are made up of a mixture of fibrous and glandular tissue and fatty tissue. And breasts are considered dense if they're more fibrous or glandular tissue than fatty tissue. And radiologists classify breast density using a four level density scale. Sorry, I'm gonna just mute my email. Okay, sorry about that. Um, from almost entirely fatty to scatter areas of fiber with you know, glandular density, heterogeneously dense, which may obscure small masses and extremely dense, which lowers the sensitivity of mammogram. So dense breast tissue is prevalent among women, but what does that mean? So dense breast tissue, um, there are a couple of implications. Um, dense breast may make it difficult for radiologists to spot cancer on mammogram because dense tissue appear white on mammogram and um, numbs both benign and cancer is also appear white. So mammo mammograms can be less accurate when you woman with dense breast with decreased sensitivity by 50 to 80%. Another implication of having breast dense, dense tissue um, is increased risk of breast cancer. So just to put things into perspective, um, the, these are the numbers um, in the data. The risk in women with extremely dense breasts, that was a fourth category um, on the prior slide, has been reported approximately four to six times greater than that of women with almost entirely fatty breasts of the first category of density. Compared to the scattered fiber glandular density, which is the second category, heterogeneous dense tissue, third category confers about 1.5-fold risk, and extremely dense tissue, the fourth category, about a two-fold risk. So what are some ways to overcome decreased sensitivity of a mammogram with dense breast tissue? Um, so digital breast tumor synthesis is a newer technique of mammogram that was 
FDA approved in 2011. Um, it's also called 3D mammogram MLA term um, in it, um, compared to a traditional mammogram which is the digital mammography um, or 2D mammogram which creates two dimensional images of the breast. So um, 3D mammogram basically take multiple images of the breast from different angles and reconstruct it into a series of stacked images. And this stack images really improve lesion characterization by radiologists, and it can improve um, cancer detection rate by 1.2 to 4.6 thousand per, uh, sorry, 4 .6 per thousand, um, mammogram that's been obtained compared to 2D alone. And this increase in cancer detection rate was seen across all breast densities due to improved lesion conspicuity. Recall rate, uh, which is a rate of being called back from screening mammogram, are also lower with tomosynthesis or 3D imaging. Um, the increase in recall rate ranges from 15 to 17%. And 3D imaging, tomosynthesis, is more likely to find invasive cancers with features that are associated with a better prognosis, which are well differentiated, um, smaller size, estrogen receptor positive cancers, and no negative cancers. So the limitation of tomosynthesis or 3D imaging is increased radiation dose. Um, so the radiation dose of getting 2D plus 3D um, increases up to 2.25 fold compared to getting a 2D alone, but so it's a wet, well below the federal limit of radiation dose. So in response to concerns of increased radiation dose, um, synthetic mammogram has been developed. So synthetic mammogram is basically a 2D images that are um, reconstructed from the tomo imaging without taking an actual 2D imaging. So whenever a woman gets a 3D um, mammogram, synthetic mammogram is automatically created. And the question is, uh, can that be substituted for the, um, the actual 2D imaging? And the radiation dose using synthetic mammogram uh, from 3D imaging is comparable to getting a 2D only. And um, there were similar outcomes in terms of cancer detection rate and recall rate um, of using synthetic mammogram only without getting an actual 2D imaging. So at our institution, we uh, tomosynthesis is standard of care for all mammograms that are obtained. Um, for screening mammogram, we um, use um, 3D, we obtain 3D imaging with synthetic mammogram without actual 2D imaging, except for women who are getting their first mammogram at our institution, and where it's been a long time since the last mammogram, and all the diagnostic imaging are obtained with both 2D and 3D. So I'm going to move on to MRI. Um, so this is a picture of um, MRI magnetic resonance imaging machine. Um, it's a large tube machine that uses strong magnets and radio waves to create images. And for breast MRI, a patient lies on a table facing down with the arms above their head, um, and the breasts are placed through the openings in the, um, in the table. And MRI performed for breast cancer detection requires use of contrast, which, which is injected into a vein. Okay, so the safety profile of MRI, um, there's no re radiation exposure that's involved with the, uh, with the MRI. Um, MRI uses strong magnets, therefore certain precautions must be taken in people who have implanted devices. So there will be a, a screen um, prior to coming for an MR, MR exam. How about during pregnancy? So there is no evidence to suggest that MR, MRI is harmful to, to the fetus. However, the use of MRI contrast, which is needed for the um, cancer detection, is contraindicated during pregnancy. An MRI contrast deposition has been reported, but the clinical importance is unknown. Um, and at this point, FDA concluded that the benefit of MRI contrast continues to outweigh any potential risk. So there are many different indications of getting breast MRI. And one of the main indication is breast cancer surveillance for women at high risk for breast cancer. Um, so American Society of Cancer provided an update of its screening guidelines in 2007 and recommended use of MRI in conjunction to a mammogram in high-risk patients that's defined as having more than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer. Um, MRI can find some cancers that are, that are not seen on mammogram. Um, the data shows that the average, average sensitivity of MRI imaging in high-risk women is around 95%, uh, with MRI yielding additional 16 cancers per thousand examined um, in addition to um, cancers that are detected on screening mammogram. 
However, it is also uh, more likely to be recommended for, for follow-up examinations and or biopsies for findings that, are, that turn out not to be a cancer. So therefore, MR breast is not routinely performed for a woman without any risk factors. Um, the specificity of um, breast MRI, uh, it's pretty, well, and there's a wide range in the literature from 56 to 98 percent. So this is a, just an example of breast MRI um, imaging um, showing a uh, breast cancer that's detected on the MRI for a woman who came for breast cancer um, um, surveillance MRI you know, for a woman with a high risk of breast cancer. So women with the significant factors um, that increase their risk score above um, a designated threshold, um, more than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, um, have a well-defined screening guidelines of using a breast MRI um, as an adjunct to the screening mammogram. How about women with intermediate risk? So in previous recommendations, um, the recommendation for use of MRI in women of intermediate risk as defined as 15 to 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer were uncertain. For example, um, this woman included um, the woman with a personal history of breast cancer, woman with a labial neoplasia or ATPI biopsy or um, with dense breast tissue. There are now newer data that are available to clarify use of MRI in this population. So women uh, with high risk lesions, um, the, the American Society of Cancer does not recommend for, for or against screening MRI in patients with lobular carcinoma in situ, LCIS, atypical lobular hyperplasia, ALH, or atypical ductal hyperplasia, ADH. More recently, the guidelines from American College of Radiology recommended consideration of MRI for this population, particularly in the presence of other risk factors, and um, also supported by 2017 National Comprehensive Cancer Network guideline. So one of the recent um, breast MRI study of women with LCIS, ALH, or ADH showed that the um, overall cancer detection rate um, by MRI, it, MRI was um, additional 12.4 cancers per thousand examined. And um, when they looked at more closely, they saw more MRI detected cancers among women with LCIS compared to ALH or ADH. Uh, about women with a dense breast tissue. Um, so dense trial um, is the biggest um, kind of a uh, biggest study that's been um, that that looked at the use of breast MRI for women with dense breast tissue. Um, it is a, a multi-central trial in Netherlands for women who have extremely dense breast, and they were randomized to a, a group. They were invited for screening MRI versus a control group who only um, underwent screening mammogram only. And these are the data. So cancer detection rate um, was 16.5 um, per thousand during the first round of screening MRI. And on the second round of MRI, the cancer detection was uh, rate was 5.8 per thousand. Um, and this reduction in cancer detection rate is not unexpected as a lot of cancers that were not seen in the mammogram alone were identified more within the first MRI examination. Um, and the, this reduction in, in the increment kind of incremental cancer detection rate uh, by MRI from the first round to the second round um, occurred um, alongside with a pretty marked decrease in false positive rates um, in the second round um, of 26.3 per thousand compared to almost 80 per thousand during the first round. So uh, the future directions of a breast MRI, um, the abbreviated MRI is basically a shortened version of a standard MRI, um, which can reduce costs and increase availability as we have more clinical evidence that's growing, supporting the performance of screening breast MRI in, in larger population of women. Um, at this point, um, it, it is in the clinical practice, but in, in many places, but um, it's not approved, uh, approved by um, insurance um, at this point. Um, and a, uh, another technique that's being investigated and not in clinical practice yet is a non-contrast MRI for cancer detection with the um, technical diffusion-weighted images. So I'm going to 
Next, talk about the use of ultrasound, which uses sound waves to image the breast. Um, there is no ionizing um, radiation that's involved. And the indications for ultrasound um, is to evaluate symptoms, non caspate lesions in a mammogram that's more kind of limp kind of focused on one area. And then we can also, we use also um, use ultrasound for breast cancer screening um, for women with dense breast tissues. So whole breast ultrasound is a, a supplemental screening exam that's designed for women with dense breast. Um, and studies have shown that there um, are additional two to four cancers that can be detected per thousand performed. Um, however, the additional cancer detection was achieved at the expense of a higher false positive interpretations. So the initial randomized multicenter trial um, investigating the utility of screen breast ultrasound was um, a 666 trial. Um, and the results show that the additional um, the addition of ultrasound to screening mammogram detected additional 4.2 cancers per thousand um, during the first year. And um, years two and three, the additional 3.7 cancers per thousand were detected. Um, and the specificity of combined mammogram whole breast ultrasound um, was 74% in the first year and an increase to 84% in years two and three. Um, what's important to understand about this study was that the, the patients were not only that have dense breast tissue, but they also were high risk with at least one additional risk factor. So, um, the studies you know, confirmed that the addition of ultrasound to mammogram in women with increased breast density um, and also with the increased risk of cancer resulted in substantial increase in detection of mammographically occult breast cancer. How, however, um, the question still remains as to what's the impact of screening breast ultrasound in women in dense breast tissue without any additional risk factors. So um, as states began implementing breast density notification laws, um, there was uh, which require uh, women to be notified of their breast density. Um, there was increasing use of supplemental whole breast ultrasound, um, screening ultrasound in asymptomatic women with normal mammograms and dense breast tissue. Um, and the Connecticut was the first you know, state to pass the notification law um, in 2009. Um, so one of the kind of earlier studies looking at whole breast ultrasound in Connecticut studied women who received whole breast ultrasound um, and 75 of them had uh, weak and no normal factors. And um, first year they, the, uh, they looked at um, cancer detection rate was 3.2 per thousand during first year, um, kind of similar to the uh, last study that I talked about. And all cancers were small than, smaller than one centimeter and no negative and a positive predictive value um, and was pretty low, uh, meaning the, um, the percentage of cancers detected among lesions biopsy, so uh, specificity was pretty low. Um, but at the year five, the cancer detection rate was still you know, remain relatively similar, 2.6 per thousand, um, but positive predictive value increased to 25%. Um, the, and less follow-up was um, recommended as the years go along. So whole breast ultrasound can be performed in two ways, handheld and, whole, and automated. Um, the handheld um, whole breast ultrasound um, is performed by a physician or ultrasound technologist um, using a handhold, handheld ultrasound probe. The limitations of handheld whole breast ultrasound includes um, that it's Operator dependent and it lacks reproducibility, um, can be time sensitive and requires specially trained staff. To overcome that limitation, automated whole breast ultrasound was developed, which uses a machine um, and uh, which performs the examination with the ultrasound probe through an automated process. And if any abnormalities are found, then a handheld ultrasound is then performed to further evaluate the machine's finding. Um, and the results show that the um, uh, their, the handheld and automated whole breast ultrasound have comparable cancer detection rates and you know, sensitivity and specificity. So just wanted to also point out that the um, MRI is more sensitive than the combination of mammo and ultrasound. So women who qualify for screening MRI should have MRI instead of screening ultrasound if they, if they have access and are able to tolerate MRI. And when MRI is performed, then um, screening ultrasound has no added benefit. All right. Um, so 
um, uh, last time I'm going to be briefly um, discussing the contrast enhanced mammogram, which is an emerging technique that uses iodinated contrast. And iodinated contrast it is the one that's being used for CT. Um, so the contrast in is injected into a vein, then the mammogram is taken. It's been approved as a diagnostic tool since 2011 and um, shown to have high sensitivity and specificity compared to MRI in terms of um, its, its role as a diagnostic tool. And its role as a screening tool is still kind of investigated. Um, the studies have been shown that cancer detection rate is 13 to 15 percent, sorry, 13 to 15 per thousand in, um, in high risk and intermediate risk women. Um, but there were more, more false positive findings than conventional mammogram. So benefits of contrast enhanced mammogram um, is that it can be obtained in women with contra contraindications to MRI and it's less expensive than MR. But it can have potential reaction to, uh, uh, people can have potential reaction to either in a contrast, which can be from mild to um, severe and severe. Um, and there may be, um, there can be additional radiation dose as well. All right, these are my references. And I'll take questions and comments at this point. For that nice overview. Uh, we do have uh, one question in the chat. Is synthetic mammography recommended over 3D mammography for women with dense breasts or a family history? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Just to clarify, um, synthetic mammogram is part of the 3D. So um, synthetic mammogram is reconstructed from the 3D imaging. The question is, do we get additional 2D imaging in addition to synthetic mammogram? So um, synthetic mammogram is part of the 3D imaging. Great, and maybe um, maybe you could just share a little bit about the uh, the services offered um, at the Brigham. What type of mammography do we do at our sites? Sure. So at uh, at Brigham, uh, we do three D imaging for every woman, whether it's a screening mammogram or diagnostic mammogram. And in terms of getting a two D imaging, like I said, for screening mammogram, we, uh, routinely three D imaging is done with just a synthetic mammogram. Um, unless it's the first time the woman's getting a screening mammogram um, in their life or at an institution, then we do 3D and 2D imaging. Um, and if it's been a few years since the last mammogram, we also want to get 3D and plus 2D imaging. Um, and for diagnostic mammogram, we always get 2D and 3D. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about um, the MRI use because there, um, we in our clinic, one of the things we do is, is we really try to, again, personalize our recommendations for enhanced screening, uh, because as you said, all these additional tools, they do have um, limitations. So none of our imaging is, is perfect. The goal of imaging, of course, is to detect cancer um, at an early stage. Uh, but some of the imaging modalities are associated with what we call higher false positive rates. Um, and, and that was pointed out with MRI as well as ultrasound. And so we do, you know, we have, we look at the risk factors for each individual woman, and we try to make those recommendations for screening, um, you know, weighing the risks and the benefits of these modalities. You touched on the high risk lesions and lobular carcinoma in situ in particular. Um, and this has been an area of of controversy, I guess, in the literature, should all women with these high-risk lesions uh, be having MRI or not? And um, although there are certainly studies, as you suggested, that show higher rates of cancer detection, our group has actually just published data from our own program, uh, women with high-risk lesions, some of them having MRI and some of them not having MRI, and actually the cancer detection rates in our group are actually equal. Um, and certainly the, the women having MRI are subject to more biopsies in their follow-up, in their surveillance period. So again, we think it's really important to have a personalized conversation about the risks and benefits of these additional tools. And certainly in some women, um, they are absolutely indicated, women who are at um, genetic risk for breast cancer, which again, we're gonna hear about in the next talk. We certainly, um, know that some of those cancers don't show up well on our standard imaging. And so we do need uh, MRI in women who are at um, inherited risk. Um, but again, not everyone can have an MRI and it is 
it is an expensive test. Um, if there's any if metallic implants, women can't have MRIs. Um, and claustrophobia is a big problem for women. So looking at new modalities, such as the contrast enhanced mammography that you um, that you mentioned briefly is really important because we, as you said, the emergent studies show that the sensitivity or the the likelihood that a contrast enhanced mammogram will find a cancer is really quite similar to the data from MRI. Um, and so we've been you know, hoping and, and working for several years to uh, think about getting contrast enhanced mammography into our program at the Brigham. And uh, we do have a, a question about that in the chat. So I am happy to say that it is coming. Um, we are working on getting contrast enhanced mammography units um, at our Brigham and Women's Faulkner Hospital Screening Center, as well as at our Dana-Farber Chestnut Hill location. So we are very hopeful in the next one to two years, hopefully closer to one, that we will have contrast enhanced mammography uh, up and running at both of those sites. Um, so one more question that has come in into the, the chat, how often would you recommend uh, other imaging besides MRI for heterogeneously dense breasts, for women with heterogeneous, heterogeneously dense breast tissue, do you, what are the screening recommendations for that group? So if there is no other risk factors, I think whole breast ultrasound is um, a good modality, modality as a screen, um, a supplemental screening tool. Um, obviously, if it, there is any other risk factors that increase the risk of breast cancer more than just having dense breast tissue, I think you know, MRI would be um, useful depending on the number. Um, but um, if without any risk factors, I think whole breast ultrasound would be beneficial. And um, can you tell us for again for our patients who are who are local who are on where where our group offers whole breast ultrasound? Yeah, so at our institution, the whole breast ultrasound is a handheld whole breast ultrasound at this point that's offered at Foxborough location, um, and we offer um, whole breast ultrasound in the area, and it's um, it's a live re, so the, the technologist will, will scan, but there will be radiologists on the site if there are any questions about any findings that are being scanned by the technologist. Great. And, you know, one of the things that's changed uh, recently is for, for many, many years, women were used to coming in and having their mammogram and getting their results right away. And now the trend has shifted where, excuse me, shifted where um, women are getting their results a day or two later. And we get a lot of questions about, about this. Can you um, explain really why the the increased value of you all being able to, to take your time and, and really look at those images and, and not giving the report right away? Sure, so, um, so there has been studies looking at the kind of efficiency and accuracy of radiologists interpreting the mammograms when we're doing live read versus reading mammograms in a batch. Um, and the studies show that it's actually the performance was better when you're reading the mammograms in a batch without any interruptions. That's why we moved to, um, to um, kind of getting rid of what we call an offline mammogram, meaning the woman come in and leave and we read those uh, kind of in, not in a couple hours or a day later um, in a batch and give the results and that you know performance has been shown to be better in that situation. So that's why we moved away from live read and, um, for better, uh, better accurate read. Yeah, and I think that's a really important message because we we certainly understand that there can be some anxiety associated with waiting for your um, your result from your mammogram, um, but the data really do show um, that the that the accuracy of the read is better again when the radiologists are able to you know sit and and read and not be interrupted um, coming back and forth you know from one patient at a time so um, again we appreciate that it's um, harder to wait but it is for a good reason um, that that we've shifted to that so all right well not seeing any other questions um, in the chat so I, I want to um, Thank you, uh, Jahi, for a really nice overview. Um, and we'll a little bit ahead of schedule, but we'll go ahead and we will um, shift gears again. We will welcome um, Jill Stopfer, one of our genetics um, ge genetics experts from Dana Farber, um, to talk to us about um, genetic testing and and breast cancer risk. Well, there we go. Okay. 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 So thank you very much, uh, Dr. King, for uh, including me in this wonderful uh, day of presentations. 
Um, I am a, a genetic counselor, as was mentioned here at Dana-Farber. And today what I wanted to do is kind of give an overview of genetics uh, and how it can be helpful for uh, people both with and without a cancer diagnosis, both for someone with cancer as well as potentially for their family. So just to start, you've seen a, a little bit about this already, that most cancer is not hereditary. It's really a smaller slice of the pie. Uh, but just to define what do we mean when we say something is hereditary, typically what we mean is that there is a gene, an inherited factor, something you get from both your parents, uh, that can be running in the family, that if you inherit this gene in a non-working form, a gene with a mutation in it, that you live your life at a very significantly increased chance to develop cancer. It doesn't mean someone is going to get cancer for sure, but it really has a, a very uh, specific and significant impact on their chance. So all because of one single gene with a powerful effect. That's generally what we're referring to when we talk about hereditary risk. And the best known examples of these are the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and 2. There's also this category called familial risk. And familial risk can mean you see a pattern of cancer in a family or a pattern of breast cancer in a family. Maybe there's more cancer than you think you would expect just due to chance alone, uh, but it's not because of one single gene by itself. It may be that in some families, there's a whole set of genes, not just one, but maybe the combined effect of 20 or 50 or even 100 different genes, each with a little bit of an impact, but all together creates a profile of risk. And right now, our genetic testing strategies are best for detecting hereditary risk. And that makes sense. It's easier to find uh, strong risk due to a single gene rather than measure the combined effect of many, many genes collectively in their interaction. But it's important to know that sometimes the family history looks suggestive and we can't find the source of risk yet. And it may be that there is some familial risk that maybe one day, hopefully not too far in the future, we'll, we'll be able to detect. Um, and then there's this very large slice of the pie called sporadic uh, cancer. And a lot of this may be due to the combined effects of uh, what we've already heard about today, environmental factors, exposures. Uh, but another source of risk for most people is actually just the aging process itself. As we get older, um, well, over the course of our lifetimes, our cells are making copies of themselves. Uh, we're not the same set of cells that we were born with. They, we've copied many, many times over. And every time a cell makes a copy of itself, there's a possibility that that copying process does not happen perfectly. And my favorite way to analogize this, it, it's sort of like photocopying or Xeroxing you know, a page. We know that copy number 500 is going to have more imperfections in it than copy number 20. And so do we. As we get older, we have all accumulated copying errors through the aging process. It's part of our biology. Um, and these errors often something that you didn't do anything to make them happen. It's just part of our biology. Um, and so uh, sporadic cancers uh, may not have a spe specific environmental or you know, risk factor that we can point to and may just be due to some of these um, random copying errors. So nature isn't perfect. Um, so when we're suspecting that there may be a single gene with a high impact in the family, what are some of the clues that we get from the family? Uh, what you see on your right here is a family tree. When we take our family trees, uh, women are circles, men are squares, just how it is. And we indicate cancer in a family. So here you can see there's a woman with an arrow here, um, she is cancer free, but she has a mother with breast cancer. Her maternal aunt had ovarian cancer. Uh, there's a grandmother with ovarian cancer. We kind of look at a family and think, is there more cancer than we would expect just due to chance alone? Um, are there multiple generations of cancer? Do we see these cancers occurring in people at ages that are younger than when these cancers typically present? 
And that will depend on the type of cancer it is. So for example, with breast cancer, seeing it diagnosed before the age of 50 is typically considered on the younger side. Uh, but for some other cancers that may naturally present at a younger age, that might not be the case. Um, so we're looking for also rare types of cancer in a family. Uh, ovarian cancer is a less common cancer. Uh, things like pancreatic cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, and then also super rare cancers we can see in families like a melanoma in the back of the eye, you know, really rare cancers. These can be clues about the possibility that hereditary risk um, is present. Uh, seeing a person in the family who they themselves have had multiple cancers that may reflect their underlying vulnerability to the process, the fact that it's happened once and then it happened again, that may indicate that they have some sort of uh, hereditary risk. Uh, and then we also look for the specific types of cancers and think about, are these ones that run together with a particular gene? So for example, when breast and ovarian cancer are in the same family, that can be highly suggestive of genetic risk due to genes such as BRCA1 or 2. So genetic testing, um, I like to analogize it as a big spell checking process. We're looking at the spelling of the genetic code. And here I have um, an example of spell checking. So I have uh, a gene on the left and I've just uh, put the word theater and theater is spelled correctly on the left, but on the right, you can see there's some sort of spelling scrambling. Uh, when a gene is spelled correctly, it provides a message that does something important for the body to protect us from developing cancer. When we do genetic testing, we're not looking for the presence or absence of a gene, but we're looking to see is the gene spelled correctly. And if there's a misspelling, like you see here, this XQ, you look at this word, it, it doesn't mean anything. What is THXQ? It, it doesn't, doesn't say anything to us. It's the same thing in genetic testing. We're looking for misspellings that would prevent a gene from working properly. And if someone has inherited a copy of a gene with a misspelling, we call it a mutation, or, or sometimes we call it a pathogenic variant. That is what leads to the increased risk of cancer compared to the uh, cancer risk in the general population. And finding these mutations is very important because it can impact your care. So how can it impact care? Well, uh, here are a number of different ways that it might affect certain women. So some women who have a breast cancer diagnosis who are uh, thinking about what sort of surgery should I be having? Uh, of course, her surgeon will offer only safe choices, but sometimes a safe choice might be a lumpectomy or just a more limited surgery. But if that woman knew that she had a hereditary risk, that meant she had a high chance for seeing a second breast cancer down the road, some women, some women, not all women, but some women may decide to have more extensive surgery, surgery on both sides or bilateral mastectomy in order to hedge against getting another breast cancer down the road. So it gives that woman and her surgeon more information to think about in making the best decision. Sometimes there are women who've never had a breast cancer diagnosis who are found to have hereditary risk who make similar choices. Uh, they may decide that they want to lower their risks as much as possible and so choose to have risk-reducing surgery. Um, there are women who, through genetic testing, are found to have a higher risk for ovarian cancer. And sometimes the right decision uh, for some women at the appropriate age is to remove ovaries and fallopian tubes in order to dramatically lower their chance. Um, Increasingly, we're seeing genetic testing sometimes affect doctors' choices for targeted therapy or trying to really match the biology of what's going on in this cancer to the best treatment option. And sometimes identifying hereditary risk as part of that process. We know that screening options might change if hereditary risk is identified. So it's already been discussed that including breast MRI, which may not be standard for all women for screening, it may be very important in women with hereditary risk. Um, and also the age at which we start that screening may be very different. 
for women with hereditary risk, we may start screening with breast MRI at age 25, for example, whereas most women are not starting screening that early. Um, hereditary cancer risk typically pulls together multiple uh, cancers due to the same gene. So it may be that some is, someone is at increased risk for more than one type of cancer. And so it's, it, we may find that there's also a higher risk for something, for example, like colon cancer, and it could change the age at which we start colonoscopy screening as, also, as well as the frequency with which we do it. So here's an example of a family where genetic testing made a big difference. In this family, we can see there's a young woman who had breast cancer at a early age, she was only 35. And interestingly, if we look at this family history, it's all on her father's side of the family. And it makes the very important point that your father's side matters just as much as your mother's side. There was nothing on her mother's side, so I've kind of left that off. But we see a concerning pattern all the way on her father's side, a uh, couple cases of ovarian cancer, very early onset uh, breast cancer. Um, and so this woman decided to have genetic testing and she was found to have a BRCA1 gene mutation. And we can see she's got three sisters. And so that information was important for her. Um, this woman who tested positive decided to have risk-reducing mastectomy on the other side. And she, at, the, uh, at, at about age uh, 40, she ended up having her ovaries removed to lower her risk for ovarian cancer. Uh, and then her sisters had tested, had testing. Uh, two of them were positive and started the high risk screening. And one of them, despite being in a family with hereditary risk, tested negative. And so she doesn't need to do all of these extra things. And so genetic testing can really help deliver the right care to the right people in the family, making sure those who are at high risk are getting the proper follow-up, but then those who don't need it, despite being part of a family with a suspicious pattern, um, when it's not necessary, we're not overdoing it. And so here are some genes that we know about that are associated with a high risk for developing cancer of the breast. And when we say high risk, we're typically talking about risk of approximately 50% lifetime chance or in some cases higher. And so you can see in this list of genes, the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and 2, can increase the risk for multiple forms of cancer, breast and ovarian, but these are cancers here that can also affect men as well as women. Prostate cancer, melanoma, and pancreas cancer can be part of the spectrum. Um, and there are other genes as well. TP53 uh, is a fairly uncommon type of hereditary risk, but associated with a, a large constellation of cancers for which there is very specialized screening. And then there are some of these others um, as well that we include in the high risk category. Um, and then there's a category that we call moderate risk genes. And moderate risk, we're typically talking something at approximately a 30% lifetime chance. And these are some examples, CHECK2, RAD51C and D, ATM, uh, BRIP1 is an ovarian cancer uh, primarily gene thought to be associated with possibly breast cancer risk in the past, but not so much uh, based on most current data. And so when we do genetic testing, we tend to do something called a multi-gene panel test, where we're looking at lots of genes at once to ensure that whatever's there, uh, we can identify in order to do these things, specialize your screening, optimize the chances of finding cancer early, um, opportunities to prevent cancer, uh, and helping your family. Uh, genetic counselors can help you move through this process by assessing your risk, discussing the benefits and limitations of testing, arranging it for you, following up depending on what the results are, and then helping include your family. Um, so uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions about uh, my presentation. I know it was kind of fast, so. No, thank you, Jill. That was wonderful. Um, so maybe just um, say a few words about, um, again, the, these panel that we test for multiple genes now, as you said, and we call that panel testing. Um, right. how, how do you counsel a, a patient as to, you know, which genes should, how many, how many genes should they be tested for? Should they do, you know, the small panel, the medium panel, the big panel? There's lots, lots of uh, uh, questions out there. 
Right, right. And and it's it's kind of a it's a great question and it has a nuanced answer. Uh, we we do have different panel sizes and some of it comes to personal choice. Typically at Dana Farber, we uh, suggest a comprehensive panel that includes genes for all the common cancers that can run in families, because the family history may or may not be suggestive of something that's there. And we've seen with sort of organ specific testing, you know, only including genes that predispose to breast cancer, only including genes that predispose to colon cancer, that we miss what we call clinically actionable or important findings that may alter the care for you or your family members. Uh, but the size of the panel can be this sort of core panel that covers the common hereditary cancers. Uh, and we can dial it up too, to include things that are increasingly rare. And so we do talk with people about, you know, what are some of the pros and cons of going big, you know, with some of the larger panels, you can find some more uncertain findings. That's really one of the main downsides of going with a big panel. You might find a mutation in a gene and that gene was only recently identified. Maybe the specific risks are still being defined. The medical recommendations for what to do about that are still being discussed. And so that can be a limitation. Uh, the other limitation, of course, can be that we see these findings called variants of uncertain significance or a VUS result. And the more genes you look at, the more likely it is that you'll run into a VUS. Most VUSs are nothing more than variable spellings in the genetic code uh, that are just less common ways to spell a gene. So back to my, I had the theater analogy uh, in, in spell checking the genetic code, you can spell theater at the end T-E-R, or you can spell it T-R-E, depending on which side of the Atlantic you live on. They're, they're alternative spellings and they're both fine. In genetic testing, we see variable sequences all the time we're not all spelled the same in our genetic code. There's a lot of normal difference. And some of these genes are really big. So for example, the BRCA2 gene is spelled with 20,000 different letters. And so there are a lot of different letters you can put here or there uh, that may reflect nothing more than just a normal sequence change. So a lot of the VUS findings that we find are, are really nothing, and they're most likely going to end up being nothing, and we put them way on the back burner. And then sometimes we encounter a VUS that's a little more interesting, and we kind of struggle with what to say about it, and you know we want to follow people more closely um, in that regard. Thank you. And just one last quick question is, what about insurance coverage? How, how would a patient know if her, her insurance will pay for this testing? So most people who are good genetic testing candidates will have coverage. Um, it gets submitted at the same time that your sample uh, is sent. And uh, we try to help with all of those arrangements. Um, a lot of people don't know that the cost of genetic testing has come down tremendously. And so even for people who don't have coverage for whatever reason, there's a limitation with their insurance, the entire self-pay price is $249, that's it. And then for our families or people who have more limited income, fortunately the labs have really generous income guidelines. So those who do have more limited resources often find that the cost of the testing is you know, reduced and, and we can typically get genetic testing for anyone who wants it. Great, thank you. Really important updates there. Um, so we are gonna move on now and um, our last speaker, but certainly not least, is uh, Dr. Pryskovsky, uh, one of our medical oncologists from Dana-Farber who has a particular interest in uh, risk and genetic risk and non-genetic risk. And she is going to uh, talk with us this morning about risk-reducing medications. So uh, welcome, Brittany. Thank you for the introduction. So um, I just wanna first say I'm excited to be here today. And the medications that I will discuss are known as chemo prevention, but from a pharmacologic standpoint, they are not chemotherapy. Let's see how I, there, figured out how to advance the slides. So our options for risk-reducing therapies depend on a woman's menopausal status. Premenopausal women are eligible for tamoxifen dosed at 20 milligrams or 5 milligrams, and postmenopausal women are eligible to take tamoxifen, raloxifene, 
anastrozole and extamestane. The last two medications, anastrozole and extamestanes are aromatase inhibitors. In contrast, tamoxifen and raloxifene are in a class of medications known as serums. Tamoxifen was FDA approved for breast cancer prevention in 1999, and this was based on three important clinical studies. And the most important study that I'll touch touch base about a little bit later is called the NSABP P1 study, and this was performed in the United States. So all of these medications have side effects. The one that stands out for most women is the fact that they cause hot flashes and menopausal symptoms. So as a provider, though, the most concerning side effects are with tamoxifen and raloxifene, where we see blood clots. Um, it's a very mild risk, but there is an increased risk of both deep vein thromboses and pulmonary embolisms. So tamoxifen also has a small increased risk of uterine cancer. So I'm gonna first talk about the NSABP P1 trial. This was the first breast cancer prevention trial. It was a randomized trial that enrolled close to 16,000 women, and they were selected to take tamoxifen or placebo for five years. The study period was from 1992 and 1996. So these options have been around for a while. Women were eligible for the study if they were age greater than 60 or if they were between the ages of 35 and 59 with a five-year predicted risk of breast cancer greater than 1.6% or if they had a diagnosis of a high-risk lesion like LCIS. Women needed to be healthy to be included in the study without evidence of breast cancer and not pregnant, and they could not be on hormonal um, therapy or hormonal replacement therapy. So in the P1 trial, after more than five years of follow-up, tamoxifen was shown to reduce the risk of invasive and non-invasive breast cancer by 50%, and this was statistically significant. There was a second tamoxifen versus placebo study that was called IBIS-1, and this confirmed the result that we saw in P1, and this showed a breast cancer reduction while patients were on therapy and then also when therapy had stopped. And so this, in this study, patients were on tamoxifen for five years and the efficacy and the risk reduction occurred while patients were on therapy for that five year period of time, but also 15 years after therapy had stopped. So there's this long lasting benefit to taking chemo prevention. And then in this study, Basically, the preventative effects of these agents is to reduce the risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So after this, tamoxifen was also compared to raloxifene in the STAR trial, and raloxifene was showed to have um, efficacy, but in addition, tamoxifen had efficacy. And then there were two trials looking at aromatase inhibitors for breast cancer prevention in postmenopausal women. And all of these agents are efficacious in this context. So when I talk to patients in clinic about these options, the biggest barrier in, is the worry about the hot flashes. So we all have negative images of hot flashes and hot flashes can be daily and they can be debilitating. However, most patients do just fine with these medications. In regards to these serious side effects, the blood clot risk with tamoxifen is 0.5% and the endometrial cancer risk is 0.4%. And the endometrial cancer risk does not extend after therapy has stopped. So in contrast to tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors do not have the blood clot or the endometrial cancer risk, but they do cause bone loss and they cause more joint aches and pains. And I sometimes find that aromatase inhibitors are not as tolerable as tamoxifen and raloxifene. So in all of these trials, there was some concern about the association with coronary heart disease risk and the risk of stroke. There was a slight trend towards more coronary artery disease and stroke in the P1 study, but this was not significant statistically compared to placebo. 
there was a slight increased risk of cataracts with tamoxifen, but this is very rare and it's intervenable with surgery. So in the context, um, this led us to investigate um, low-dose tamoxifen in Italy. So this was a study that looked at five milligrams of tamoxifen compared to 20 milligrams, which was the standard. The idea was that five milligrams would be more tolerable and they looked at a shorter duration of therapy of three years. The study showed that low dose tamoxifen for three years reduced the incidence of breast cancer. This was a big result and it was practice changing for us here at Brigham and Women's and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And compared with tamoxifen in the study, there was more frequent hot flashes, okay? So between tamoxifen five milligrams and placebo, there was not a significant difference in the hot flash intensity, vaginal dryness, or musculoskeletal pain. However, for both vaginal dryness and musculoskeletal pain, they, they, the side effects increased with time over the three years of the study. And I think this really just reflects that um, patients on this study are aging. And so they do develop um, more dryness and maybe get more achy with age. And so I tell patients that we feel very comfortable if they do have vaginal dryness while on chemo prevention of using um, estradiol creams. So that is something that we frequently prescribe if patients do experience that symptom. So there is also data that low-dose tamoxifen at a dose of 2.5 milligrams can decrease breast density. So this is an advantage, too, since lowering breast density allows for early detection. So in B-PREP, since we started um, this B-PREP clinic, around 23% of patients with high-risk lesions, including atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and LCAS. These patients will start chemo prevention, and we found that up to a third of women will start greater than six months after their first visit. This is work that we've published. I've published this with Dr. King and Dr. Laws, and this basically means that sometimes patients need to ponder this decision before starting chemo prevention, and that's completely fine. Since we started offering do low dose tamoxifen, it has become one of our most popular options in the clinic. And for most women, I recommend starting at five milligrams. And if they're premenopausal, I'll try to encourage them to go up to the 20 milligram dose if they're able to tolerate the therapy. In postmenopausal women, women, we feel very comfortable with the five milligram dose. So in conclusion, medications can prevent breast cancer in both pre- and postmenopausal women who are high risk. There's a lower chance of serious side effects if women try these therapies at a younger age. So we definitely target our younger women who are higher risk in their 40s and 50s to consider chemo prevention. Tamoxifen also lowers the risk of breast cancer while women are on therapy, but also when therapy has stopped. Low-dose tamoxifen may be more tolerable than the 20 milligram dose. Low-dose can also decrease breast density on mammogram and is likely best for women who are postmenopausal. but for women who are premenopausal, we'll often start, start at the five milligrams and discuss increasing to a higher dose. And I think that's kind of the, the summary of chemo prevention in this context. Great. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Biskofsky. Maybe you can just keep that slide there for a moment while we while we look at some questions. Um, so one question that just came in was, do you have a smaller chance of developing a blood clot with the lower dose of tamoxifen? So I would say we don't have great data to look at that endpoint because the trial for low dose tamoxifen in Italy was a smaller study. So in contrast to the NSABP1 study that included 16,000 women, the study in Italy with low dose tamoxifen only included 500 women. Would you agree, Dr. King? 
Well, it was a smaller number of women, but they did look at those serious adverse events like thrombosis and uterine cancer, and, the, and there was no statistically significant increased risk compared to placebo. So yeah. we all walk around with a certain low level of risk of developing a blood clot. If we do things like smoke cigarettes or take hormone replacement therapy or even birth control pills, all of those things slightly elevate our risk of developing a blood clot. Um, but as Dr. Piskovsky noted, the risk after being on five years of tamoxifen is still only about a half percent. So it really is small, but it's something that women need to be aware of so that if they were to develop some unusual leg pain or some unusual leg swelling, that they would know to call their physicians, have it evaluated, potentially stop the, the medication uh, until they were sure that they didn't have um, a blood clot. But yeah. again, as we've said throughout this forum, you know, all of all of these, um, all of the information for women at elevated risk of breast cancer really needs to be personalized. You know, whether it's increased, whether it's using MRI, whether it's using medication, it really is a discussion about the risks and benefits um, for each individual and understanding that these medicines are are one of the options um, that we have. And and importantly, as as was mentioned, it, these medications prevent or reduce the risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. We still need a lot of work to identify um, ways to reduce the risk of estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. And Dr. Eliason's uh, research on diet is you know, really important in that arena. Um, and just again, a plug for the women with the high risk lesions, uh, Dr. Biskowski showed you uh, that in our our program, about a quarter of our women with high-risk lesions uh, will choose to try these medications. These medications are particularly effective in women with high-risk lesions because women with high-risk lesions overwhelmingly get hormone receptor positive breast cancer, ER positive breast cancer. So when we know what type of breast cancer a woman is most likely to develop, then these, um, these strategies become increasingly important and effective in, in that group. Um, so we have a question about the TAM gel study. So Dr. Piskowski uh, and, and the rest of us, we, we participated in that study. We put patients on the trial. Um, do you want to give us a, an update, um, Brittany, any news out yet? I, I don't think the final results have been published. Yes, definitely. Hopefully think... soon. Yes, we're all very eager to um, see the results of the TAM gel study. For those of you um, who aren't familiar with it. it uh, as, as we've said, the side effects of these medicines are, are the biggest barrier often to um, getting patients to, to try them and take them. And so there have been, there's a lot of research in looking at, again, alternate ways to deliver the active ingredients of tamoxifen. And so one of the one of the ways that was being studied was putting the, the medicine in a gel and then asking women to rub the gel on their breast uh, once a day for a year. And the investigators were looking to see if using that gel resulted in a change in breast density, which as Dr. Pitskovsky said, showing that we've reduced breast density is a good sign that we're reducing breast cancer risk. And so we eagerly await the results of that study. And, and if in fact, that study does show that um, putting the gel with tamoxifen on the breast, if that reduces breast density, then that will be a really um, big signal and a, and a good opportunity for that gel to go into even a larger trial where we would um, really be looking to see if it can uh, prevent breast cancer. Um, so here we have another um, question. Um, should, a pa should a patient take another round of tamoxifen if she took it and it's been a long time? So 15 years, she, she took five years of tamoxifen, 15 years later, should she take another round? I, I would say probably not. The only situation where I think it could be discussed and it could be a personalized discussion would be if, for example, something was found on a biopsy, like a high-risk lesion, including ADH, ALH, LCIS, then I think there could be a, a nuanced discussion about um, you know, considering another medication for prevention, whether that's an aromatase inhibitor or tamoxifen for a short, short period of time. But typically, if patients have taken 20 milligrams of tamoxifen for five years, we would not recommend um, additional therapy. Yes. 
Um, okay, and how about one more? Does taking UVFM more than three times a week increase your risk of breast cancer? I would say, no, it does not increase your risk of breast cancer. So this is a, a medication that's used typically for vaginal dryness. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, I think, discussions about systemic absorption of medications. And the really the studies show that these medications do not increase breast cancer risk significantly. Yes, and uh, very important even in our breast cancer survivors, if they're having significant challenges with vaginal dryness, we are very comfortable with them using these um, topical agents. Um, so wonderful. So um, just to wrap up here then, um, I just wanna again, thank everyone for joining. I wanna remind everyone that again, part of our goal is um, education. We want to um, keep you informed and we wanna of course hear from you and learn from you. Uh, we do send newsletters out from, the B, from our B Prep program. These are just a couple of examples of uh, newsletters that we have shared uh, with our patients um, in the past. Again, highlighting our really um, fabulous staff, highlighting um, upcoming uh, research opportunities and giving you uh, health and wellness tips. And so uh, be on the lookout for our next newsletter, which will be coming out and will um, highlight some of the really important um, messages that you heard this morning. Um, and also any questions that we didn't get answered, uh, we will try to include those in uh, the newsletter. Um, also, I just want to again, remind people about our website. Uh, so this is the B Prep website. Um, there's lots of important links out from this website to uh, other resources. Um, and also, again, this is where we will be posting uh, the videos from, from this morning's uh, forum. And you can certainly find ways to contact us uh, also on the website there. Uh, again, the videos from the previous forums are also on our website. So if there's a topic that you have questions about that we didn't cover this morning, um, we may have covered it in one of the previous years. So I hope that you um, will, be, will be able to take a look. And it does, we will again be putting this morning's content on the website. It does take us a, a couple of weeks to get all the videos processed. So be patient, but it will be there. And again, I just want to put in one um, last plug for the really important research that's being uh, done at the Brigham and the Farber. Again, members of our BPREP team, as well as our, our breast surgery group and laboratory investigators, uh, all working together uh, to try to understand, again, breast cancer risk and, and, and importantly, breast cancer disparities. And so just put in one more plug. Uh, if you can go to www.brightfuturesprize.org and uh, vote for our team. Um, we are very uh, excited about this line of investigation, looking at the impact of societal stress on the immune system as a contributor to the disparities and outcomes that we see between uh, white and black women. And we know that these disparities exist both in their opportunities even to get into a CS to talk about breast cancer risk. We've, we've recently been exploring this and are hoping to increase our outreach uh, opportunities uh, but we also certainly know that these disparities exist uh, once women are diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I was just asked to put the link into the chat. So give me just one moment to type this in. See if I can multitask here. Right. Futures. I think Dr. Mittendorf got, has it in there. Okay. Right, perfect. She beat me to it. All right. Yeah. Well, now you have it twice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so again, thank you all very much um, for joining, uh, depending on where you are logging in from this morning. Uh, I hope that you are safe from this, uh, this storm that's heading up the East Coast. Um, so everybody uh, stay safe, stay dry. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Right.